Good morning, everyone. Oh, there are too many people in here for me not to get a, at least a six and a half on a scale of 10. So I'm going to say it again. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We have an amazing uh, long line of folks who I think are lining up for yogurt. Is that what we're, well, for the free yogurt? I know I was here for the free yogurt this morning. No. Just wanted to uh, say welcome. Welcome to Diversity Forum 2019, our 20th anniversary. I can already tell this year's forum is going to be absolutely amazing. Um, before we begin, I, of course, want to acknowledge that the University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dejo since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly, but unsuccessfully, sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. The history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that brings us together here today. Now, let's get down to business. Let's get to the program. Uh, up first will be our Chancellor, Rebecca Blank, who is an economist who has worked in three different presidential administrations. She holds a doctoral degree from MIT, and has served on the faculty at Princeton, Northwestern, and the University of Michigan, where she was the dean of the Ford School of Public Policy. She and I have both celebrated this. We're entering our seventh year, right, Chancellor? Seven years in the role. We're excited that she's with us, and we're excited for her leadership. Please extend a warm welcome for Chancellor Rebecca Blank. Good morning. This is a wonderful crowd. Um, those of you who are still looking for seats, there are a whole bunch of seats right up front. <laughs> it's like every classroom. No one wants to sit right in front of the teacher. Um, it is great to see the crowd today. And um, thank you, Patrick, for all of your work and for your staff's work in pulling together this whole event. The, uh, the crowd is a sign of the quality of these events and how much people want to attend. I hope you're all going to leave today with some new ideas and new connections and um, a new sense of the role that you can play in making the University of Wisconsin a more diverse and a more inclusive place. I also hope that you'll leave feeling somewhat inspired, not only by one another, but by the great lineup of speakers that we have, including ABC News correspondent John Quinones, who is going to give the keynote address in just a few minutes. As always, this event um, gives us the ability to sit back a little, to mark the progress we've made, and to acknowledge what else we need to accomplish, how far we have to go to make this place, this campus, a place that feels welcoming to everyone. Issues relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion are being raised across the country. There's nothing here that's unique to the University of Wisconsin and Madison. But some recent events have brought these issues particularly to the forefront of this campus. The homecoming video released last month that excluded students of color demonstrated again that too many of our students feel invisible or isolated on the campus. That video sparked a number of actions and activities by students of color and members of underrepresented groups on campus. We support our students' exercise of their free speech rights. We are listening to them and talking to them about their concerns and about what they want to see change. A couple of weeks ago, I met with a group of students, faculty, and staff at the Wisconsin School of Business as part of their Diversity Lunch and Learn series. Uh, um, a number of students were there, and one of them stood up and asked, what are we doing to deal with diversity on campus? And I want to share with you four things that we are working on, four programs that we have put in place in recent years that I think are beginning to show results. Um, as a sign of what are some of the things that we're trying to do. The first of these is our public history project. The public history project arose from a campus study group that looked into a history of two campus groups in the early 1920s that were called the Ku Klux Klan. Not, not, one of them was not affiliated formally with the Klan, one was. The study group's findings pointed to a need 
to build a more inclusive community in part through an honest reckoning of our past and of the stories of our past. As a result of that recommendation, we're investing a million dollars in a multi-year effort to uncover and give voice to those who've experienced challenges and prejudice here on campus. Um, in September, we hired a director for the project who's going to lead a two to three year effort here designed to uncover the stories of certain groups whose history has probably not been told as well on this campus, their public history. And once that research is done, we will have both digital archives, including that information, those stories, we'll find ways to put some public presentations out there. And as part of this, um, uh, the, the, the director, Casey Butcher, is going to be teaching a number of classes on um, methods, on oral history and collecting this sort of information, and um, including both undergraduates and graduate students in the collection of the information as well. I'm very much looking forward to seeing how that project develops. I know that it may uncover some past histories that can lead potentially to some difficult conversations, but those are conversations we have to be willing to have in order to understand our past, to learn from it, to claim it, and to realize how we want to be different in the future. The second program that I'll mention is one you're gonna hear more about in just a few minutes. The Our Shared Future program is meant to help us learn about and acknowledge one particularly difficult part of our history. Some of you know, as um, Patrick noted in his introduction, UW-Madison sits on the ancestral homelands of the Ho-Chunk people. They were here for 13,000 years before being forcibly removed, but they came back. We began last summer to tell that story, and we have plans to continue to do that in a number of different ways, as you're going to hear shortly from Omer Polar. Um, many of you might have seen the plaque that's sitting right here, if not, I, I realize those of you there can't possibly even see this, but um, come by and look at it before you leave today. This is going to be out in front of, um, on, on the hill in front of Bascom Hall. Um, right now, there's a large um, steam tunnel construction project going on over there. Um, but as soon as that's finished, this moves to its permanent location. And in the meantime, it's traveling around campus. So um, I am hoping that um, this plaque, which in part in its travels around campus, is part of the requirement if you're going to host it, is you have to do some events that keep people to think about this history. Aaron Bird Bear, many of you know, Aaron can't be here today, but he has been very deeply involved in this effort since it began, and he has agreed to um, fill our newly created position of Director of Tribal Relations, and I'm very excited about that new role, um, working more closely between us and the tribes here in the state of Wisconsin. Third program, as we've um, acknowledging the difficult aspects of our past, we also need to look towards what we're doing to change the way this campus looks and operates. Many of you participated in a campus climate survey back in the fall of 2016, and one of the things we heard from that survey again and again from our students is, I need professors who look like me. So we're making a very deliberate effort to diversify our faculty not just racial diversity, but diversity broadly defined, gender, culture, background, ability, um, academic approach, those sorts of things. Last year, we created a new hiring program we call Targets of Opportunity Program, or TOP, that provides central campus funding to make it possible for departments to go after faculty they'd like to recruit from groups who are not well represented within their discipline. And these are targeted efforts where they identify an individual and make an offer outside of their normal hiring process. In the first year of TOP, we authorized 42 hires. Um, we have had 16 accepted offers. There are still six offers pending. And um, you know, if we can hire 20 new faculty every year for four or five years, that will start changing the face of our faculty over time. We are already authorized a few additional recruitments and there will be more to come in 2020, 2021, and 2022. Let me give you an example of the impact of the program. Electrical and chemical engineering wanted to bring in more diverse faculty, but they were having a hard time doing that. It is an extraordinarily competitive because the pipeline for women as well as people of color is extremely small in that field. This past summer, they use top funds to go after a rising star, an African-American engineer who is not working in academia and wouldn't have shown up in their authorized searches. 
He accepted their offer and he's going to join us in 2020. He is the first person of color that department has successfully recruited in 20 years. And of course, once... Once we talk about these recruitments, we have to in the same breath and we have to do everything we need to do to make sure we don't just hire people, but we retain them in the long run. And we're working with departments on that as well. Finally, last program. Um, I want to talk a minute about Bucky's Tuition Promise, um, BTP as we call it. Um, this is a program designed to make UW-Madison more accessible to low-income students from across the state of Wisconsin. That's critical to our mission here as a public university for the entire state. And we have not been as successful as some of our peer institutions in recruiting students who are very low income who qualify for Pell Grants. Bucky's Tuition Promise makes a very simple pledge. If you get accepted to the University of Madison and your family isn't in the bottom half of the income distribution in the state of Wisconsin, those are the only two requirements, we will guarantee four years of tuition and fees that are covered by scholarship funds. And um, that message, the simplicity of that message, if your child gets into the University of Wisconsin and you come from a lower income family in the state, we will cover your tuition and fees. The simplicity and clarity of that message, I think is very important to the success of this program. Um, this fall, we welcomed our second cohort of Bucky's Tuition Promise students. We have almost 850, 848 students. They come from 65 of Wisconsin's 72 counties, and they are exactly the type of people, the type of students that we want here at UW-Madison. They're academically outstanding, they're diverse, many of them are first-generation students. One of the new cohort, for example, is a student from Milwaukee who grew up in the foster care system and became a presidential scholar in high school. He had great offers from 14 other universities, but Bucky's tuition promise convinced him to come here. In short, we're working on a number of different fronts, but as I've said in other years at this event, working towards diversity and inclusion is not a project to be finished. It is a process which we will be engaged in throughout all of our lifetimes. Every time we take one step, we need to think about what the next step is after that. And I very much look forward to hearing about what are the ideas um, and excitement and things that come out of this forum, because this is always a very fruitful set of conversations that help us think about what are the next steps we need to be taking. Let me close with a brief story. 50 years ago, in 1969, the UW Law School hired its first African-American faculty member. His name was James E. Jones, Jr. He grew up in Arkansas and came to UW to study law. After he graduated, he took a job in Washington, D.C. He became a top lawyer in the U.S. Department of Labor and a recognized expert on civil rights. But he wanted to teach, so he returned to UW and became an award-winning teacher and a founder of a teaching fellowship aimed at preparing lawyers from historically underrepresented groups for tenure-track faculty positions. He was eager to explode the myth that there were no people of color who would qualify as faculty candidates. That fellowship became a model for others around the country, and fellows of that program are now teaching in more than 30 law schools all across the United States. When Professor Jones passed away in 2014, his former students got together and raised funds in his honor. They managed to raise a million dollars. We added another million from a special fund out of our current fundraising campaign. And this last August, we created the James E. Jones Jr. Chair at the UW Law School. That's not the first endowed chair named for a person of color on this campus, but it is one of too few. Endowed professorships are one of the strongest tools we have for both recruiting and retaining top faculty. One of Professor Jones' former students, who went on to become the first Native American woman to serve as a dean of a U.S. law school, remembers him telling her, if you don't see the thing you're looking for in an institution, create it. Don't let anyone tell you it can't be done. Figure out how to do it and then do it. I hope you remember that advice as you work through today, the weeks, and the years ahead. Figure out how to do it and then do it. I want to thank you all again for being here today, for everything you are doing to make this campus a better place. Have a great conversation and a great set of meetings and on Wisconsin. Thank you.
Thank you, Chancellor Blank. Well, as I shared earlier, this is our 20th anniversary for the Diversity Forum. And our goal over the years has been focused around three principal projects. We want this experience to be an opportunity where we update you. We want this experience to be an opportunity where we educate you. We want this experience to be an opportunity where we activate you. So we update, educate, and activate. This year's theme, Building Bridges to a Better Future, Opportunities, opportunities Through Access and Exposure. We plan to focus on the building blocks of our goal to create a campus community that is truly inclusive and welcoming for everyone. This work really happens in community. It cannot happen through my office alone or the chancellor's office or the provost's office or senior administrators. It's everyday folk like us. Everyone in this room and those who are listening to us in the uh, feed, where's the camera? I'll wave to him and say, hey, sorry we couldn't be here. We need a bigger room. But um, it's that investment from every member of this community that helps us accomplish the goal of creating an environment that supports all of our, our participants. The old adage is, it literally takes a village. Well, that's true for us here. From providing financial access uh, through the Bucky's tuition promise, to exposing young children to opportunities never thought before or possible through higher education, shout out to our pre-college programs. These are part of those bridges and strategies that expand our capacity to make systemic changes to support access to the tools of growth and success for all students, faculty, and staff. Our speakers and breakout sessions over the next two days will cover promising practices, building strong relationships between people and the bridges that connect them. Most of all, we'll take a long, hard look at intention versus impact. As many of you know, November is National Native American Heritage Month, or Native November as it's fondly known on campus. This month also marks the start of Aaron Birdbear as UW-Madison's first Director of Tribal Relations. As an alumnus and Assistant Dean for Student Diversity and his role educating the campus on First Nations history, he is uniquely qualified to step into strengthening and partnership between the university and Wisconsin's First Nations. Even though Aaron can be with us, he is certainly in our thoughts and our prayers, his family, and his time of bereavement. I'd now like to take this opportunity to introduce to you Omar Polar, who is an enrolled member of the Sekogan Chippewa community and serves as American Indian Curriculum Services Coordinator in the School of Education. In that position, he supports learning about First Nations, cultures, languages, histories, and sovereignty. He leads UW-Madison's First Nations cultural landscape tours and is involved with campus community signage projects, including UW-Madison's Our Shared Future effort. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a warm welcome for Omar Pola. We are about to know O Anishinaabe and Wewen, Anishinaabe Mon. First, I would like to begin a little with the, uh, one of our indigenous languages, uh, Anishinaabe Mon. Nino gigeshib, gidininim. I want to say good morning to you all. Let's say that together. Let's say good morning and Anishinaabe Mon. How about that? Minno gigeshib. Minno gigeshib. All right, good, good. That's so easy to do. So easy to do. How about another one? Buju. Buju, buju. Hello, everybody. Buju, nij gikino emogeniduk. Hello, those of you who may be my fellow learners. Ogajiash and Dijnikaz, Mia Wadi, Wasa, Giwadanang, Wenjabai, Anin, Dewe, Gishikaming, Zaka, Agening, and Donjaba. So, I'm originally from the Mole Lake Sakag and Chippewa community. My name is Omar Polar. I work at the School of Education with American Indian Curriculum Services, and I'm so happy to be here this morning um, beginning our time together with an indigenous language. Indigenous languages are so, so important, so important to the First Nations communities of Wisconsin. They're so important because they encode thousands and thousands and thousands of years of human experience in this place. They encode the knowledge the teachings, the values, the ways of being, the worldviews of the indigenous peoples of this place. They encode the diversity of this place. This has always been a diverse place. 
There have always been many different peoples, many different ways of living well in this place. They're so important that there are some communities here in Wisconsin who say, you know, when we no longer speak our language, we will no longer be the same people. These languages are critically endangered, critically endangered. You know, not just here in Wisconsin, but across the continent. You know, if we really care about diversity, first and foremost, I argue, we would care about these indigenous languages that represent the knowledge systems of this place, the knowledge systems that emerged out of thousands and thousands of years on this land. That no matter where we live in Wisconsin, there's a deep, deep indigenous history and, in, and indigenous worldviews and knowledge systems that emerged out of thousands of years of a close conscious cultural connection to place. No matter where we are, we have a legal relationship with one of those First Nations here in Madison. We have an ongoing legal relationship through the Treaty of 1832 with the Ho-Chunk Nation. But no matter where you are, we have those legal relationships and there are those knowledge systems uh, are still present and all around us today. They emerged out of thousands and thousands of years, 12,000 years of at least of human history in this place. That these knowledge systems are the knowledge systems of this place. And it's only very recently that our particular way of thinking, you know, the kind of Western worldviews, the English language came to this place. Ho-Chunk history represents 98% of the human story of this place. That our history here is only really about 1.4%. But that 1.4% has obscured, has erased the stories of Ho-Chunk people. How many people here feel confident in their understandings of First Nations? Let's raise your hands. There's a few people here. I see a few people in back. But very few of us had, have had opportunities to learn about First Nations growing up. Um, and very few of us still have opportunities to learn about the diversity of First Nations, the 12 First Nations of Wisconsin, their, their histories, their languages, their cultures, their worldviews, their unique legal relationships with the, first, with, uh, with the federal government. How can we begin to create better opportunities for ourselves to humbly learn about our First Nations neighbors, the people who have always been here, the people with the knowledge systems, the worldviews that emerge from deep conscious cultural connections to this place. As a community, we are just at the very beginning of our efforts to really begin to think about how can we do a better job of creating these learning opportunities and engaging in respectful, responsible relationships with First Nations. I'm so happy that we now have our first ever tribal relations director. What a great accomplishment. That's really great. And I can't think of anybody better than Aaron Birdbear to, to lead our community through developing those longstanding, um, mutually res uh, respectful uh, relationships with First Nations. But Aaron cannot do it on his own. He cannot do it on his own. I know he's going to have many responsibilities. Um, each one of us has, has, has to play our part. We have so much unlearning to do and relearning to do that each one of us has a role. Each one of us has a legal relationship with the First Nation. Each one of us is on First Nations land. We all have a responsibility. So we are. Um, we are in a place now, a historic moment, as Chancellor Blank shared, where for the first time ever in our institution's history, 171 years, we have acknowledged the hard truths of our place. That ethnic cleansing, in fact, did happen in our place. How do we deal with that responsibly, respectfully, as a community? How do we create these learning opportunities for us to understand this history? The R Shared Future Marker is hopefully one of our first attempts at doing that. The R Shared Future Marker is an opportunity for us to reflect um, on this history that each 
sentence, each word in the marker is meant to be discussed, is meant to be thought about. Um, you know, what does, uh, who are the Ho-Chunk people? How do we learn about them? How do we learn about their language and how important that is to them? What is a treaty? How are we all treaty people? That we are all partners in that treaty. We are benefiting from that treaty as we sit here today. What is the Treaty of 1832? What is the story of, of ethnic cleansing? More importantly, what is the story of Ho-Chunk resistance and everything that they went through, their ancestors went through to come back to this place? How does this history of colonization affect all of us? How are we all shaped by it, by what we see, what we don't see? You know, the stories that we tell, the stories that we don't tell. What is sovereignty? Why is that so important to First Nations communities? What is inherent sovereignty? And how do we respect that inherent sovereignty? How do we understand what respect means to First Nations communities? So how can we all engage in this learning journey together with humility, you know, at all levels, at the highest level, but each one of us, how can we use this marker as an opportunity to have these discussions in each of our workplaces, to think about how this history shapes the work that we do? How is this an opportunity for us to learn, to reflect, and to begin think thinking differently about the way that we think about education, you know. What would it look like if we began to truly understand and honor First Nations ways of being and ways of learning? How might that transform the way that we understand ourselves? How might that transform the way that we think and do our work here on this campus? So I encourage you all, please, please, um, Please take this, this historic moment in our institution's history and reflect and do work, have conversations in your own places across campus. There are a number of opportunities. The marker will be moving around campus. Um, and also, uh, there is a grant program called Our Shared Future, which is offered um, through the Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning, encouraging units across campus to begin to think about how to integrate this teaching and learning in curricula across campus. But you don't have to just be a professor, you don't have to do, teach a class in order to do this. No matter where you are, there are opportunities for these discussions. How can we grow together over the next couple of years? Uh, how can we learn together? And how can we make good on our commitments to the Ho-Chunk Nation that we will truly begin to incorporate this story into the work that we do? President Cleveland, uh, following the June 18th event, said that he hoped that this marker would be the spark, the spark that would encourage non-Native people to learn about Ho-Chunks and the sacredness with which they view this land. How do we keep that spark alive? How do we make the next 171 years very different than the last? So with that, I want to say miigwech, thank you all, and gigawaba maninam, I will see you all again. There's no word for goodbye in Anishinaabe moan. Miigwech. Thank you, Omar, for your thoughtful acknowledgement. Now, I have the honor of introducing our keynote. Mr. John Quinones. Uh, John was born in San Antonio, Texas. It was during high school that Mr. Quinones resolved to overcome Hispanic stereotyping and pursue a career in journalism. A TRIO Upper Bound program participant, shout out to our CEO program, TRIO. That program he participated in was at St. Mary's University in San Antonio. And that program helped prepare him for college level work, earn his bachelor's degree in speech communication in 1974. In 1979, he earned his master's degree from the Columbia University School of Journalism. During his 35-year tenure at ABC News, he has reported extensively for all programs and platforms and served as an anchor for prime time. Quiones is now the anchor of the very popular show, What Would You Do?, one of the highest rated news television programs in recent history. 
Uh, John Quinones is an amazing gentleman. I had an opportunity to spend some time with him last night. Incredibly down to earth, incredibly personable. I think you're going to be in for an amazing treat. I want to take this time to segue to a video he asked that we share before he comes on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, John Quinones. Hi, guys. Hello, hello. How are you? Wow. What a crowd. That's amazing. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for pronouncing Quinones so well. You know, it's not the easiest name to pronounce. Uh, you know, even people at ABC have trouble with introducing me. I've been called everything from Quinn Ones to to Quinones, uh, so it's, um, thank you, that's very well done. Um, yes, uh, it's a real pleasure and a real honor uh, to be with all of you here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and what an impressive forum this is, addressing such a vitally important issue in this country, diversity. Now more than ever, I think we need to embrace and nurture the beauty, the beauty of diversity in our schools, in the workplace, within our government, of course, throughout this nation, <clears throat> not only with regard to ethnicity, of course, not only with regard to the color of our skin, but w with issues that are more inclusive and includes all LGBTQ identities, as well as immigration and socioeconomic status. I know about the importance of all that and the value of all that, perhaps better than anyone in this room, because of the world that I grew up in and the challenges that I faced, <clears throat> not only as a student, but also because I do this TV show called What Would You Do? Where I have seen how people react on hidden camera uh, when confronted with issues like racism and discrimination. I've been doing the show for a dozen years now. You know, when we started with What Would You Do? I thought we would run out of ideas. I mean, how many can you do, right? I thought, you know, maybe we'll do three shows. <laughs> Here we are, a dozen years later, and we've done a thousand scenarios, and ABC News wants us back next summer with a whole another season of 13 more hours of the show. So we're very excited, and there's a lot of material to work with. Uh, but because of that, I understand the value more than anyone, I think. Um, yes, I host What Would You Do? So you have been warned. You know, we can put those hidden cameras anywhere. 
like in this room, if you're sitting there and the person next to you passes out and you step over them to go get another cup of coffee, <laughs> you're going to have me to talk to. <laughs> It's, um, what would you do is a show that I created about a dozen years ago after being at ABC News as a reporter for decades. Uh, I started with Peter Jennings doing World News Tonight and then with Diane and Barbara Walters in 2020 and Primetime Live. But a dozen years ago, we created the show because we wanted to hold up a mirror to American society. We wanted to know how do you unlock the power and the light that's within each one of us so that we will all be better equipped to say, you know, that's wrong, or I can help. Uh, what would you do poses that very question. When you witness any kind of injustice and, and the, you know, racism, discrimination, gay bashing, someone being ridiculed because of their religion, uh, bullying among children, spousal abuse, when you see any of that and that little voice in the back of your head says, do something, do you step away or do you step in? What would you do? I mean, after all, isn't that the very definition of a man or a woman's character? It's not what we do when everyone's watching. That's easy. It's what we do even when no one is watching. It's all about, as Spike Lee would say, doing the right thing. You know, we face, we all face these moral and ethical issues Every day, both in our personal lives and in our professional lives, no matter what we do for a living. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're a college student here, whether you work in healthcare, the legal profession, politics, corporate America, education, or in, in my profession, the news media and journalism. What do we do when we witness deception or corruption or injustice? Every day, we come face to face with moral and ethical dilemmas as we go about our lives. The question is, what do you do with that opportunity to right a wrong? Do you sound the alarm, lend a helping hand, or do you just mind your own business and walk away? Too often, I think, too often we say to ourselves, well, if I don't say anything, if I don't do anything, who's going to know if I didn't get involved? Who's going to care? Who's going to find out? Well, instead, I think we should be saying to ourselves, you know, in my heart, I will know that I could have done something, and that should be all the reasoning you need to step in and do the right thing. Because silence, silence is complicity. It's all about compassion. <clears throat> looking out for your fellow man, looking out for your fellow woman, so important now more than ever in this country than ever before. I have never seen this country as divided as it is right now. And I grew up during the civil rights movement. I mean, all you have to do is look at the current and ugly debates over race and religion, the condemnation of Muslims, transgenders, the LGBT community. There's this boiling debate over immigration down at the border with families being ripped apart simply because parents were trying to look for a better life for their children. This week, just this week, two hours south of us in Naperville, a family is told, an African-American family at a Buffalo Wings celebrating a birthday is told to move from that table because of a racist nearby didn't want to be sitting next to them. Just this week, an hour and a half west, east of us in Milwaukee, the Latino man who had battery acid thrown on his face, <clears throat> excuse me, thrown on his face by a racist who, who just wanted to know why he was in this country illegally. The guy has been here legally for 20 years. That's all you have to see. Race, you know, hate crimes in this country are up by 20% over the last two years. Uh, in Colorado this week, a man was arrested, a white supremacist, for plotting to blow up a synagogue. What would you do? You know, about politicians. Those politicians keep talking about building higher and higher walls around this country, when in my humble opinion, we should be building stronger and stronger bridges between the beautiful mosaic. It's the, it's the people of the America, the Americas. And, you know, over all these years, uh, we've done about, as I mentioned, a thousand what would you do scenarios, ethical dilemmas. All of them are based on real life situations. I mean, I get messages on social media all the time from people saying, John, uh, I had a what would you do moment today, and I thought you were going to come out. Where were you? <laughs> I, mean, I tell them I'm only one man. 
You know, and these scenarios, you know, they, they happen to all of us, e all of us, e even me. You know, here I am, I think I'm a famous television reporter with my own TV show on network television. Well, the other day, I was at an airport getting ready to get on a plane. And I was lucky enough to be flying in first class, so I'm in the first class line. The sign says, line up here, so I did. And I look over to my left, and I notice that all the other first class passengers, by mistake, have lined up in the, in the economy line. Not a big deal, but I'm standing in the right place, I thought, right? And as I'm standing there, and I wasn't dressed like this, I had a sweatshirt and a baseball cap, and the lady in the front of the other line, the first class passengers, she looked at me and said, sir, we're over here. The first class passengers are over here. I didn't say a word. I just pointed to the sign above me, but I went back to the back of that line just to satisfy her. And on my way back, she, said, she yelled out, the announcement was made in English. We speak English in America. And all the other people in line who knew me from television had that same reaction. They're like, <laughs> what? oh my God, John, is this a what would you do scenario? <laughs> I said, no, this is real life, unfortunately. And as I'm standing in the back of the line back there, getting ready to get on the plane, my only fear was that I was gonna have to sit next to this mean lady. <laughs> Really? On the plane? <laughs> and uh, fortunately, no. She was sitting by herself, no surprise there, by the window, still grumbling and angry, and I couldn't resist. I leaned over to her as I, as I was getting to my seat, and I said, Ma'am, my name is John Quinones, and I do a TV show called What Would You Do? And you would be perfect for the show, you know? Uh, you could play the part of the racist, you know? <laughs> She just gave me another dirty look. You know? <laughs> and that's why we do the show, because the country, I think, needs it now more than ever. I get the greatest compliment on social media the other day when someone wrote, the world would be a better place if we all thought John Quinones was in the next room <laughs> monitoring our behavior, because of course, we would be on our best behavior. And of course, hosting this TV show for so many years has made it impossible for me to go have dinner anywhere without people asking, what's going to happen here? <laughs> Where are the hidden cameras? It's like, I'm going to eat, OK? Um, but the other day, I was on an airplane, and I snuck up on a flight attendant. She hadn't seen me on the plane, and I was going to the lavatory. And suddenly, we were face to face. And she let out a scream. She says, oh my god, it's John Quinones. What's going to happen on the airplane now? <laughs> so how do we do it? How do we become active bystanders and not just passive observers of injustice. I think it's as simple as putting yourselves in the shoes of the victim. And you know, in some ways, it's easier for some of us who have been there. After all these years of doing the show, I found that time and again, the people who step in and get involved and come to the rescue are the folks who themselves have been the targets of racism or bullying or gay bashing or spousal abuse. They sound the alarm because they know what it's like, how painful it can be. They've been there. And that's precisely why I feel that I was like destined. I was kind of born to do this kind of show because of where I grew up and the world that, that I faced and the hurdles that I had to overcome. You see, a lot of people who only know me from television, who see me up there with the great people of ABC News, you know, David Muir, and Robin Roberts, and George Stephanopoulos, People who only know me from television have no idea the long, hard struggle that it took for John Quinones to get to ABC News. I was born in the barrio, on the west side of San Antonio, the poor neighborhoods of San Antonio. And I didn't speak a word of English when I was six years old. This, despite the fact that my family has been in San Antonio for seven generations, in Texas. You know, we've been there. People forget Texas was once part of Spain and Mexico, right? And so was California, Nuevo Mexico, Colorado, you know, Utah, parts of Wyoming. I mean, but who's counting, right? Uh, they were all part of Mexico and Spain. So uh, we, we've been there for seven generations, the Quinones family. I get a kick out of today when people come up to me and say, John Quinones, you're Mexican-American. When did your family cross the border and cross the Rio Grande and come here? I'm like, we were always here, you know? I am more American than probably everyone in this room. I tell folks, I didn't cross the border. The border crossed me, you know? <laughs> and suddenly, 
It's crazy. But, uh, but it, was a tough, it was a tough life in the barrio in San Antonio. My dad was a janitor you know, my, who made $50 a week. My mom uh, used to clean houses on the rich part of town. Um, we, uh, they, they dropped, my father dropped out of the third grade to pick cotton in Lockhart, Texas, just outside San Antonio to help support his single mom. And my, my mother also dropped out of the fourth grade. So they spoke very little. English when we were going up. I'll never forget. I didn't either because, you know, the church was in Spanish, the corner the, where we went to church. The store that we did business in was, everyone spoke Spanish. The music that we danced to and listened to was in Spanish. So we didn't have to in San Antonio where 60% of the population is Latino. Um, now, mind you, I'm very proud to be an American first and foremost. I don't think I would have been given these opportunities in Mexico had I grown up there. But I was also very proud, and we, my family, very proud of our culture. It was tough, though. I'll, I'll never forget going to the first grade at Carvajal Elementary, which was a block away from my house. And there I am in Mrs. Gregory's first grade class, the first day of school, little six-year-old Juanito Quinones. And I'm there kind of twiddling my thumbs because I didn't understand what the teacher was saying. And she, this is before bilingual education. And by the way, we didn't go to preschool or kindergarten. My two sisters and I, we couldn't afford it. So there I am in class sitting at 10 in the morning, the school bell rings, and of course it's recess time, and all the kids are going out to the playground. Where does little Juanito Quinones go? I walked home. <laughs> I lived just a block from the school, and I'll never forget, forget going to the front door at my mom's, my, my dearly departed mother Maria, and, and I said, she said to me, Juanito, ¿qué pasó? What happened? And I said, se acabó, it's over, mom. I, I like school, two hours and you're done. And this, is, this is gonna work out very nicely. <laughs> she grabbed me by the ear and literally dragged me back to Mrs. Gregory's first grade class because she knew the value of an education not having gotten one herself. They used to punish us in school for speaking Spanish uh, in public school. The, 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 the coach at our school had a big old paddle, a wooden paddle, uh, with holes drilled in it for extra power and speed. And they would give us three spankings on our rear ends if they caught us speaking Spanish. Uh, when I was eight years old, my dad made very little money, so I, I did everything I could to try to help the family, even at the age of eight. So my cousin Joey and I, we became shoeshine boys. Uh, I built a little shoeshine box from scratch, bought some polish and rags, and my cousin Joey and I would go to all the, the cantinas, the bars in San Antonio, because the drunk guys didn't realize how much they were tipping you. <laughs> and we made a killing until one night we're coming home and we got jumped by a gang. You know, it was a tough neighborhood with drive-by shootings and drugs and crime, and they stole all my rags and my earnings from the night, and that was the end of my shoe shining career at the age of eight years old. And then when I was 13, my father was laid off from work, you know. He was a janitor at the high school that I wound up going to. And um, we did what a lot of Latino families in South Texas had to do back then. We became migrant farm workers. My two sisters, my mother Maria and my father Bruno and I, we got on the back of these trucks with these strangers, seven trucks headed north. People we didn't know. We're sitting in the back of these trucks, really not knowing where we were headed, and we journeyed 1,700 miles. They brought us to Northport, Michigan, the cherry capital of the world, where we picked cherries for 75 cents a bucket. And I remember strapping these buckets around my neck and teetering on the top of these ladders, overlooking orchards and orchards of cherry trees. And it would take me two hours, two hours, to fill that darn bucket with little cherries for 75 cents. I'll never forget that. And then after picking cherries for six or seven weeks, we did what all migrant farm workers do. We followed the crops, right? You follow the crops down to Ohio, to Toledo, a little town outside Toledo called Swanton, Ohio, where we picked tomatoes. And man, I was a champion tomato picker. They would pay us 35 cents a bushel and I would do 100 bushels a day. That's $35 back then a day, and my father would do 130 bushels, and my mother would contribute to that, and my sisters would contribute to that, and we learn the value, right, as many of you here have, of the family coming together in times of adversity and pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. But I'll never forget,
being on my knees on the cold, hard ground at six in the morning, looking at a row of tomato plants that for a young 13-year-old boy's eyes seemed to go on for miles and miles. That's what I had to look forward to that day. And my father, Bruno, looking down and saying, Juanito, do you want to do this kind of work for the rest of your life? Or do you want to get a college education someday? It was a no-brainer. <laughs> I knew that I didn't want to do that kind of back-breaking work for the rest of my life, but very few people believed in me. When I came back to San Antonio, and I would ask my teachers and my counselors in the ninth grade, how do I prepare for the ACTs? How do I prepare for the SATs, right? How do I take advanced placement classes in math, biology, English? Do you know what my own teachers would say? My own counselors would look at me and say, John, it's wonderful that you have this dream of someday being a television reporter. Because I wanted to be a reporter since I was 12. I used to watch Geraldo Rivera. On, <laughs> remember Geraldo on 2020? And, um, and he was doing all these great stories. And I thought he was Latino. Later, I find out he's only half. He's, uh, <laughs> he's Puerto Rican Jewish. <laughs> But no, seriously, he was a great reporter with mustache and long hair and blue jeans. And he would go to Turkey and Colombia, South America, and he would do these great stories. He had a show called Good Night America, where he would do investigative stories and then debate issues, kind of like Nightline and Ted Koppel, uh, but a precursor to that. So I wanted to be like Geraldo. He was the only one on, on national television with a Hispanic last name, never mind that he really was. But I thought he was my hero. But so when I would ask my teachers, how do I prepare for college? They would look at me and say, it's great, John, that you have this dream of someday being a television reporter, but we think you should try wood shop or metal shop or auto mechanics. Not that there's anything wrong with those great trades. A lot of my relatives make a good hard living doing that kind of work. But I wanted to go to college and my own teachers and my own counselors in my public school would do what people do on that show, what would you do every Friday night? They judged me by the color of my skin and the accent in my voice. You know, the great African-American poet Maya Angelou once wrote that we all marvel at the beauty of a butterfly. We look at a butterfly and we just marvel at the gorgeous colors and the wingspans and how beautiful it is. But seldom do we consider all the changes that that butterfly has to go through to attain that beauty. And man, I'm no butterfly, but, but we went through some changes. And thank God for my mother, Maria. She was the one who kept pushing and pushing. She was the one who said, mijo, my son, mijo, don't be embarrassed of having to wear the same clothes to school every other day. At least we wash those clothes, right? They're clean. She would say, mijo, don't be embarrassed about having to take bean and tortilla tacos for lunch when all the other kids are taking their fancy bologna and white bread. <laughs> now we know beans and tortillas have more protein, right? We got the last laugh on that one. But she would say, it doesn't matter, son. What matters is what's in here in your brain, how you feel about yourself, and what's in here in your corazón, in your heart. So she's the one that kept me moving along, and it was during the Civil Rights Movement, and I remembered the words of Martin Luther King who once said that in times of adversity, you got to have faith. <clears throat> you got to have faith. And faith is taking that first step. It doesn't matter if you can't see the entire staircase. Just take that first step. Because tomorrow, there'll be another step. And the next day, another baby step. Well, my first step, because I had a heavy Mexican accent. For example, in Spanish, there is no SH sound, right? So I would say, this is my chert. These are my chews. And people would make fun of me. And I knew that if I was going to be like my hero, Geraldo, or Peter Jennings, or Walter Cronkite, or Dan Rather, or Tom Brokaw, I had to get rid of my accent. And I love accents. But I knew that if I was ever going to be on national television in America, I'd have to speak fluent English. And, uh, and I was also painfully shy. And I knew that wasn't, that wasn't going to work. I would never be able to stand on a stage like this. So I forced myself, following the advice of Martin Luther King, to take that first step, even if you can't see the entire staircase. I forced myself to join the drama club at my junior high school. 
And, um, and I tried out for the role of Romeo in Romeo and Juliet for a citywide production in San Antonio. And I tried out for the role of Romeo. But, and maybe, maybe it's because no one else tried out. <laughs> but I wound up getting the role. Now, the good news was that I got to kiss Juliet, you know. Mary Lou Gomez, I wonder. <laughs> yeah. She was my first girlfriend, and we had to practice kissing behind the curtain just to make sure we got it right. You know? it's called, is it called method acting? Is that it, Patrick? Uh, uh, that was the good news. And the, the bad news was that in this ridiculously macho Hispanic school in San Antonio, I had, I had to wear leotards, and thank God there was no YouTube back then. But that was the first step. And then along came the first hero in my life, besides my mother and my father, and it was my English teacher. I mean, you talk about the value of education. It was my English teacher in the 10th grade, Mrs. Gutierrez, who said to me, John, I love the way you tell stories. I love the way you write your essays. Have you thought about journalism, perhaps? And I said, of course. I've been watching Geraldo all these years. <laughs> She said, no, no, I think you should write for the school newspaper, the Brackenridge Times. And she introduced me to the man who ran the school newspaper, the teacher, Mr. Harris. And I went and met him, and I was hired as a reporter. So I've been doing this since I was 13 years old. And within a couple of months, they promoted me to the chief of editorials. So there I was, writing these big investigative stories, like, why are the teachers parking in the students' parking spaces, you know? <laughs> Tonight we go undercover and find out. <laughs> and I loved it. I loved it. And then along came the next hero in my life. And sometimes heroes don't have to be people. In my case, it was a government program called Upward Bound, part of the TRIO programs, right? You have the CO program here that's very similar. It, it was for high school students. And the theory, the government knew that the inner city schools were doing a lousy job of preparing us for college, if at all. So the government knew under the Kennedy and Johnson administrations back in the 60s and 70s, they knew that we needed help. So the government took 10 students. They interviewed a bunch of kids all over the country. But from every inner city, from Detroit to Los Angeles to San Antonio, they interviewed kids who showed some spark of promise. I don't know what they saw in me, because my grades were not that great, but I was selected as one of 10 students from my high school to take part in Upward Bound. And it was a beautiful program, because we would take, they would give us extra courses in math, biology, and English on Saturdays during our high school career, just what I was asking of my teachers. And then every summer, we would get to live on a college campus for six weeks when we're in the 10th grade of school, the 11th grade, and the 12th grade. What a concept. Not only good for a kid who would be the first in his family to go to college, but also for our parents who didn't understand always, you know, letting their kids go. You know, Latino families, you know, were very tight. Uh, I still remember saying goodbye to my mother when I went to live at Southwest Texas State University, which was 45 minutes from my house. I'm going to go for six weeks. I'm in the driveway saying goodbye to mom. She's like, mijo, mijo, when am I going to see you? You would think I was going to Vietnam. It's like, you know, when am I going to see you again? And it's, mom, I'm going to be back Saturday with some dirty laundry. And, you know, and I want to want some of those bean and tortilla tacos, please. Uh, it was a wonderful program, Upward Bound. I wouldn't be here today standing in front of you had it not been for a program that today politicians would call welfare. Upward Bound and the TRIO programs are still fighting tooth and nail every year for their budgets in this country. Thank God they still exist. But a lot of people call it welfare, you know, government handout for these inner city kids. For me, it was a lifeline. I got to go to St. Mary's University in San Antonio. And, and then I, I had three jobs when I was in college, like some of the students here, I'm sure. I worked in the geology department sorting rocks. I worked in the college, in the cafeteria. And at night, I got to be careful how I say it, because when I say I deliver drugs, people, you know, oh, yeah, you're a, Lat you're a Latino kid. You're a drug dealer, right? No, I, I worked at a pharmacy, and I delivered medicine in an old, I drove a beat-up Volkswagen, and I would go to the homes of the elderly to deliver medicine, prescription medicine. 
that they couldn't go to the drugstore and pick up themselves. But even then, I was practicing on overcoming my accent. I had a little beat up cassette recorder. And between my deliveries, I would go into the men's room and I would record my voice and play it back and record it and play it back. And one night, the owner of the drugstore, this guy, Richard Teniente, heard me through the men's room door recording my voice. And he said, John, you, you, when I came out, he said, you really want to do this, huh? I said, yes. Yes, and he said, well, I know the general manager of a radio station here in San Antonio, and they're looking for interns. Internships, really important, students, no matter what you're going into, right? <laughs> Absolutely. That's all he had to say. So for the next three weeks, I was bothering him every day. Please introduce me to him. And he finally took me to this radio station that was hiring interns. And by the way, the reason they were hiring interns was because there was this radical group of Latinos in San Antonio protesting to have more people like of color on radio and television in San Antonio. There were very few, despite the fact that 60% of the population was Hispanic. The federal government, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, mandated that you have to have a staff on the air that represents the population of that city. That wasn't the case. So when these people started protesting and, and threatening to to, to take the licenses away from radio and TV stations. The radio and sta TV stations freaked out. They started grabbing anyone with a decent voice. And there I was, delivering medicine in San Antonio with a decent voice. And I was hired as an intern. Well, you gotta be from Texas to understand this. I worked, at, I, I, was, I was 18 years old, right? I loved R&B music. I loved Mexican music. I loved some of the early stages of rap. And I'll, I'll, this was a country music <laughs> station. And I wasn't a big fan. KKYX, Kicks was the name of the station. But it was an opportunity to get an internship. So I, I went and met the general manager. He hires me for $2 an hour. I was 18 years old, freshman in college. And you gotta be from Texas to understand this. The disc jockeys, you know the guys who played the music at the radio station, had horses in the back of the studios that they would use in parades and public appearances and rodeos. And, my job for two bucks an hour, my first job in broadcasting was to clean up the horse poop in the back corral and feed the horses. But at night, I would sneak into the control room, back into the back offices of the radio station where they had these beautiful reel-to-reel -reel recorders and a gorgeous microphone. And I got to practice, I got to record my voice. The only problem was, it was midnight, right? And the professionals, the announcers who could help me, we're gone. The only one there left to criticize my work was the janitor, and his name was Pablo Gonzalez, and Pablo's English was worse than my father's, but I would drag him in there. I'd say, Pablo, listen to my recording. What do you think? He would say, muscle menos, more or less. It sounds pretty good. <laughs> and then they let me do something on the air for the first time. Again, following the advice of Martin Luther King, take that first step. You don't have to see the entire staircase. Uh, they let me do something on the air for the first time. There would be some new medicine out, right? And I got to tell you where you could buy that medicine. So you want to hear what the first words John Quinones ever said in broadcasting? Okay. I got to say, <clears throat> I got to say, now available at Walgreens. That was it. <laughs> I was so proud. I was so proud. <laughs> I, I would call all my relatives and friends and like, uncles and aunts and my grand, you gotta listen at 1.12 this afternoon, but don't blink, because you, that was me on the radio. Uh, but that's how you do it. And then they let me do the news on Sunday nights. It was really Monday morning between one and four. In the morning, I would do five minutes of news between the country music, right? And I think we had four listeners, my mother, my father, and my two sisters. <laughs> But that's how you do it. That's how you do it. You want to make mistakes in a small little country music station, not on national television at ABC. And from there, I, I got a job at another radio station in Houston, and, uh, but still making very little money. And I wanted television. I wanted to do television, and very, no one believed in me. I can show you 80 letters of rejection that I got from news directors at TV stations in Amarillo, San Antonio, my hometown, Austin, Dallas, Houston. No one would hire me because I didn't have any experience, and they already had. They would tell me, they, we already have one Hispanic reporter. <laughs> we don't need another one. I mean, 
It was ridiculous. And I was depressed, and I was about ready to give up on journalism and go to law school. I thought, maybe I'll try law school. And it's funny how life is. At one of an, audi at an audition for a show that I didn't wind up getting the work, uh, I met a woman who had gone to Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism in New York, this Ivy League school. And I told her my story. And she said, John, don't give up. Don't give up on journalism. You have such a passion for telling stories, I can tell. Don't go to law school. You'll be a lousy lawyer. You'll be bored to death. She said, but if you want to go back to school, uh, why don't you do what I did? She said, I went to Columbia. It's a one-year program. You get a master's degree in journalism. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful degree to have. And if you want, I'll write a letter of recommendation for you. The stranger reached out. And she did, and I did, and I got accepted to Columbia University. And then I said, great, now how am I going to pay for it? <laughs> so I got on a cheap, you know, I remember it back then, it was a Pan American Airways flight. It was an overnight $75 flight to New York from Houston. And I went and I knocked on every financial aid door at the university, and I said, please, I've been accepted to your school. But I can't afford it. I mean, can I have a job? Can I have a grant? Can, can, is there anything you can offer? And I wound up, they put me up for a fellowship from NBC News, and I got it. Ironically, I worked, I've worked 37 years for ABC, but my education was paid by NBC. I feel like, <laughs> I, feel like I owe something to the Today Show, you know? <laughs> but that's how I, that's how I got to, to Columbia, and like the Beverly Hillbillies, I packed up a U-Haul trailer and I moved to New York from Texas, and I loved it, living, I covered the United Nations there, and I covered the South Bronx. It's a one-year program, you get a master's from this great Ivy League school, and because of that, um, I got my first job at CBS uh, Television in Chicago, not far from here, right, at WBBM Channel 2. And the, re and the way I got that job, and here's a, here's a message to you students, um, at Columbia, on Monday nights, there was a guest lecturer that would come in and speak to the journalism class. There was about 120 of us. And it was like, it could be Peter Jennings, it could be Dan Rather, I mean, some of the great people of network television, news, or the, the publisher of the New York Times. And one night, it was the president of CBS News, a man named Richard, uh, 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 let's, yeah, let's see here, it was Richard, uh, Simpson, I think, yes. Well, Richard Simpson was the president of CBS News, and he gave a talk. And after his class, after his lecture, I was the only one with the guts to go up to them, Richard Salant. And I said, Mr. Salant, um, I'd like to interview you for my master's project. Uh, and he said, fine, you can call my assistant and we'll set up an appointment, which was a bunch of BS. I wanted to give him my resume because I was graduating in three months. So, so but, but he thought I was going to interview him. So she set it up. I called his assistant. I, next, you know, a couple of weeks later, I go to West 57th Street in New York to Mr. Salant's office, and I go in there, and I do this 10-minute interview with him. And then at the end of my interview, I reached into my pocket and said, by the way, Mr. Salant, I'm graduating in May, and I, and I brought my resume, and I thought perhaps and he looked at me, and he shook his head. But the next day, I got a call from the vice president of CBS News saying, I just received your resume from the president of this news division, who describes you as a very enterprising young man. <laughs> and they interviewed me, and they hired me to go to Chicago as, as the local general assignment reporter at WBBM. And it was while I was in Chicago that I did a story that I wanted to do for a long time about an issue that, by the way, is still a hot-button issue in this country today, illegal immigration. Now, I came, you know, we were born in Texas for generations, as I said, but I knew, had friends who had come over illegally, and I wanted to know, I wanted to tell the story. I was asking the question, what are the push factors that make an immigrant try to risk their lives crossing the Rio Grande or the Devil's Highway, El Camino del Diablo in, in, in Arizona, to come get a job here, leaving their loved ones behind, leaving their families, their mothers, their daughters, their you know, wives, to come get a job here for very little money, you know, $2 an hour doing roofing or, you know, dishwashing at restaurants. How, how desperate must they be? And what are the push factors that make them come here, right? I asked. And I, so I convinced my news director in Chicago at WBBM to let me go undercover 
and go into Mexico, right, and tell the story of an immigrant. I was going to pose as someone trying to come into the U.S. Um, I told all my friends, I'm going to do this big story. I'm going to pose as a Mexican. <laughs> they all had the same reaction. I said, John, it's not going to take a lot of acting, you know. No, but because I look the way I do, because of the world I come from, because I speak Spanish, I was able to go, and the news director said, fine, that's a great story. Go, if you're willing to, do, to take that risk, we'd love to do that story. So they sent me with a camera crew into Mexico, and I found a coyote, a smuggler, who for $300 sold me a fake birth certificate and a fake social security card. And he said to me, he thought I was just another Latino. He didn't know, no idea I was a reporter. Uh, obviously, I wasn't dressed like this, and I was about 25 years old. I looked the part of the typical young immigrant trying to cross the river to come to this country for a better life. So he said, okay, give me the money, 300 bucks. Tonight, meet me down on the banks of the Rio Grande, and I'll cross you into Laredo, Texas. So I said, okay, well, I'll see you there on the banks of the river. In Spanish, of course, speaking only Spanish. Then I went to the American side of the border, and I told my camera crew where to hide in the bushes. And I said, okay, tonight at 7 o'clock, I hope, we'll be coming across the river. And I went back into Mexico. Back then, you could go back and forth very easily. And I met up with a coyote, the smuggler. And, you know, thank God he was a decent man <laughs> because a lot of these guys, they know that the immigrants have been saving all their lives for this crossing. And they'll often just beat them up, take their money, or leave them for dead in the Rio Grande. Who's going to care? These were just immigrants doing something illegal anyway, right? Who every day bodies wash up on the Rio Grande today and the deserts of Arizona of people struggling to get into this country by often being led astray by the coyotes, the smuggler. Thank God my coyote was a decent guy. And he takes me down to the banks of the river and he tells me to take my clothes off and put them in a plastic bag because obviously when you cross the river you want your clothes dry because if they're wet, you know, the Border Patrol will know you just crossed the river. So I was a little nervous because I was wearing a wireless microphone like this one, and I, I thought he might see it if I take my shirt off. So I convinced him to let me keep my shirt on. And, and then he said, okay, he didn't care. He puts me on an inner tube, and I floated across the Rio Grande from Mexico to Laredo, Texas, all captured on hidden camera. And I didn't stop there. Because remember, this is for a story in Chicago, right? So I went to Chicago, and I found a restaurant where the owner of this restaurant had seven undocumented workers working for him, and he had not paid them in 17 weeks. And every time these workers would complain, he would say, hey, guys, you get to sleep here in the basement. You get to eat all the food you want. You keep complaining, and I'll call ICE. I'll call immigration and have you deported. And by the way, that happens in this country today. So I went to that restaurant, pretending that I just came across from Mexico, speaking only Spanish. He had no idea that I was a reporter. And he hires me as a dishwasher. I applied for work, and he hires me as a dishwasher. So by day, I'm there washing dishes and bussing tables with the other workers. And then at night, I went down into the basement. I slept with the other men next to the dishes and the silverware and the cans of food. And I still wonder what those other workers, those other seven Mexican workers, must have thought when I suddenly, by day, I'm washing dishes with them. And then at night, I pulled out a little camera and I started interviewing them about their lives. And they explained to me how they, through tears, how they were being held as virtual slaves in this country. Well, the next day, I came back to work this time wearing a suit, speaking fluent English, with a camera crew behind me. And I remember we had to chase the owner of that restaurant through the parking lot because he didn't want to talk to me about what he was doing to those men. Well, the story aired a few days later on CBS News in Chicago, the story of my crossing the Rio Grande and working in that restaurant and how the abuse these men were suffering. And the day after that story aired, the U.S. government moved in they shut down the restaurant, they arrested the owner, and they got the Mexican workers the money they were owed and temporary visas to remain in this country while they worked on their residency. And I knew then that those are the kinds of stories that as a Hispanic reporter, you talk about the value of diversity, those are the kinds of stories that I could tell better than anyone. Um, 
I, I call journalism the candle in the darkness. Remember, imagine this room is pitch dark, there's been a, a snowstorm outside, and all the electricity is out, and we can't even see our hands in front of our faces. Well, the journalist, he or she, is the person with the little flashlight or the little candle, and they can shine it on the darkest corners of this room to illuminate corruption, to illuminate racism, discrimination, and civil rights violations, human rights violations. I think when journalism is done right, and we're not doing it right all the time these days, but when it's done right, those are the kinds of stories that we should be telling. Um, thank God for that story. It won my first Emmy Award. There have been seven. <laughs> that was the first one. And, um, And ABC News was watching, and Peter Jennings was watching from New York. They saw me and the story that I did, or a tape of it, and they were looking for Latino reporters to cover Central America because there were wars breaking out, some of you might remember, in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Panama, the Contras, the Sandinistas. This is back in the 80s. And ABC News had a correspondent by the name of Bill Stewart, this great correspondent for ABC, who was sent to cover the war in Nicaragua between the Contra rebels, I mean, between the Sandinista rebels and the dictator there, uh, Anastasio Somoza. And when, when Bill Stewart goes down there, and if you Google Bill Stewart, you'll see the awful thing that happened to him. He couldn't speak a word of Spanish. And he's confronted by these soldiers, and he's asked all these questions. He can't respond. They force him down on his knees. They put a gun to his head, and they shot and killed him and his translator, who was trailing behind. Um, the, you know, it was a huge story. And the networks then, all of them, CBS, NBC, and ABC, and all their wisdom said, we should hire somebody who speaks Spanish to go to Latin America. Right? And there I was in Chicago with my little Emmy Award from crossing the Rio Grande, and I was hired by ABC to be based in Miami to cover all of Latin America, but particularly Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, Salvador, Nicaragua, and then later Panama. And, um, and the irony of all this did not escape me. I mean, he was a kid who used to get punished for speaking Spanish in class. Remember the coach had a big old paddle. And I wind up getting my dream job in network television precisely because I spoke Spanish. But I loved it. I did it you know, for 10 and 15 years. I traipsed all over Latin America. And I worked with Peter Jennings. I don't know if you remember him, but he was one of our greatest anchormen. He was amazing. The guy was just amazing and, and intimidating. He was just so impeccably dressed all the time. He had a perfect, he had that Canadian accent. And, um, and he just scared the hell out of me <laughs> as a young reporter. I mean, I, he was like James Bond, right? Agent 007. And I was hired by them, and one of my first stories that I did for uh, Peter Jennings was to go to Nicaragua, and I had an exclusive interview, I got an exclusive interview, with the president of Nicaragua, a guy named Daniel Ortega, who, by the way, is still the president today. He's back. <laughs> and, uh, but he was, uh, back then, he was, uh, he was the president of Nicaragua, and I got a big exclusive interview, and it was a big deal to do that back then. So I called New York, and I get Peter Jennings on the phone, shaking in my boots, and I said, Peter, I have an exclusive interview with the president. He's like, fine, young man. I don't think he knew my name. He's fine, young man. He's on the phone. I was in Nicaragua. He's in New York. And he says, I look forward to putting your story on World News tonight, tonight. So I hang up with Peter Jennings. And the phone rings again. And it's the president's office in Nicaragua canceling the interview. And man, now I got to call New York. It's 4.30 in the afternoon. The news goes on at 6.30 nationwide. They had made a two-minute hole in the newscast for my story, and now I can't deliver it? I thought for sure I was going to get yelled at, maybe fired by Peter Jennings uh, for not being able to deliver that. And instead, Peter Jennings gave me some words of advice that I carry with me to this very day. He said, John, this is going to happen again in your career when someone promises you something and they don't deliver. He said, remember this. Don't worry so much about talking to the movers and the shakers of the world. You know, the presidents of corporations, the presidents of countries, the presidents of corporations, politicians. Those people, he said, they can always gather the press and issue a press release, right? Those powerful people 
can, 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 can call a news conference and get their message out anytime they want. So don't worry so much about talking to the movers and the shakers of the world. Talk instead to the moved and the shaken. In other words, talk to the real people out there, the campesinos in Nicaragua and Guatemala and Honduras and Mexico. As a Latino reporter, he said, you can go into the countryside of those countries and communicate with people in a way I could never, he said, and you can get the word out. You can give a voice to people who don't have a voice. You do that, young man, and you'll be a success. And that's all I did for the next 15 years, traipsing around Latin America trying to do just that, not talking, worried so much about talking to the movers and the shakers, but instead talking to the moved and the shaken. But I always wanted to work for 2020 or Primetime Live, you know, like my hero, Geraldo, uh, for the larger magazine stories, because on the evening news, I only got two minutes of, to go on the air. Well, you know, for the magazines like 2020, it was a mini documentary. And I was down in Colombia covering the president elections, one, presidential elections one year. And the story didn't turn out to be much of a story, the elections. But in Bogota, Colombia, I was looking out my hotel room window and I saw these children during the day, all dirty, clearly homeless, who were running around sniffing glue. They had glue on, the, on their sleeves and they would get high, some of them as young as six years old. And at night, I would see them open the manhole covers on the streets and climb down into the sewers. So I asked the woman who worked for us in Colombia, I said, Maria, who, who are those kids? And she goes, ah, they're called gamines, gamines. They're like street urchins. They're children nobody wants. They're runaways, castaways, and they, um, they, they, they live in the sewers. And I couldn't believe it. They live in the sewers. And I said, is anyone trying to help them? She goes, yeah, there's, uh, there's this wealthy industrialist, uh, Jaime Jaramillo is his name, a Colombian, who finds oil for American oil companies all over Latin America. But at night, he can't sleep knowing there are children who live in these conditions. So at night, you know, he goes down there trying to help them. I said, what about the government, the military, the police? He goes, well, are you kidding? The police and the military, they want to clean up the streets of Bogota. But they're afraid to go down and chase these kids into the sewers, these 300 kids who live down there. So what they do, the police and the military, is they open up the manhole covers, they pour gasoline down there, and they throw a match to, f f you know, to bring them out, flush them out. And I was like, oh my god, I couldn't believe it. So I met with the man who was trying to do something to open an orphanage for them, Jaime Jaramillo. And he showed me an album full of pictures of children he had rescued from the sewers. And he would go down there with a bucket of chicken and a loaf of bread and six pack of Cokes. And he would do what he could to try to help these children, los gamines, they called them. I couldn't believe it, so I called New York and I said, look, I, I, I know I don't work for 2020 or prime time, but I would love to do this story. The producer of the show said, fine, if you're crazy enough to want to go into the sewers, who would go? I said, we will go. My cameraman and I will go. And he said, go for it. And we spent two weeks down in the sewers of Bogota, Colombia. Can you imagine living next to the rivers of waste of 30 million people in Bogota? I was down there. We interviewed these children. I, met, I interviewed a 16-year-old girl who had just given birth to a baby. Imagine starting your life in the sewers. Uh, we filmed all of this for two two weeks. We brought it back to New York, and a few weeks later, I put it on Primetime Live with Sam Donaldson and Diane Sawyer. And the day after my story aired on the children of the sewers in Colombia, uh, viewers like yourself sent in a million dollars in donations to Jaime Jaramillo, this man who was trying to help them. He was able to pull the 300 kids out of the sewers, build an orphanage, and then those kids were playing tennis in Florida and skiing in Colorado. He was able to do good because of the power of that camera, I think when it's used in the right direction, <laughs> purpose. You know? So I could go on and on, but I know that uh, you would probably, you want to see one of my what would you do scenarios, one of the favorite ones. We did one that I thought this audience would appreciate. Uh, what would you do if you see someone stealing a bike? What if it's a white guy or a black person or a very attractive young woman? What would you do? If you roll the tape, then we'll talk about it afterward.
Uh, we did the same one in New Jersey. We had the same scenario, uh, and the same thing happened in New Jersey. But at the end, you know, this middle-aged couple, they were on their bicycles, and they saw, they saw the woman, the, the young woman, crack, you know, cutting the chain. And the wife said to her husband, honey, she's stealing that bike. And he said, yes, but she's a damsel in distress. I need to help her. So he goes over and he's pulling the bike out of the pole. And of course, the actress is going along with it saying, you're so strong. He's like, thank you, thank you. And she said, do you see any cops around? So now he's looking for the police. He's an accomplice. I still wonder what the ride home with his wife must have been like uh, after we told him it was, what would you do? But my favorite stories, uh, these are fun, but my favorite ones are the, deal, the ones that deal also with, with race and, and religion and, and homelessness. Uh, we did a scenario, uh, what would you do if you're walking down the street and the person in front of you collapses? You know, she could have had a heart attack. Or he could have suffered a stroke. You don't know. Um, and we did it in New Jersey at 8 in the morning, right by the train station in Newark, New Jersey, when people are in a hurry to get to work or to get to school, right? So now you have that added element. Not only do you not know how to help somebody medically, right, who's fallen, but you don't have time. You're in a hurry. You need to get to school or to work and make that train. Well, at first, we did it with a well-dressed businesswoman, you know, who's in her 40s, walking along, a stunt artist who falls very convincingly, and she collapses. And when she fell, this, this, this middle-aged, you know, businesswoman, People immediately, within seconds, every time, they stopped, they helped her, they called 911, they covered her with a coat, and we were blown away. And we said, wow, who would have thought? Newark, New Jersey, people are so nice. And then we said, but wait a minute, what if we switch things up? And instead of a well-dressed businesswoman, the victim is an elderly man who's homeless. He's dirty and smelly and disheveled and bearded in his 80s, and he's walking along and he collapses. We got an actor to play that part, another stunt artist. When we had the elderly homeless man holding a beer can in his hand, 88 people walked by and no one was stopping to help. People are stepping over him. One lady made the sign of the cross and kept walking. And we're like, well, I guess if you're elderly, homeless, and you collapse, you're not going to get a lot of help. And I was about ready to come out, you know, when I come out with the cameras and I ask people why they did what they did. But before I could get out there, we heard the tapping of a walking cane on the sidewalk. Didn't see anything, we just heard it. And then suddenly into the uh, frame of the hidden camera comes this beautiful African-American woman who's stumbling along with a cane because she has suffered a stroke. And guess what? She's homeless herself. And guess what? She stops to help. And she starts asking people going by, excuse me, does someone have a cell phone to call 911 for this man? He was white, she's black. Not that that should matter. 37 more people go by and no one is stopping. She then stumbles down to him because remember, she'd had a stroke. She stumbles down, puts her cane to the side and she takes the, she did something we didn't expect. She, she takes the beer can out of the homeless man's hands and struggles over and puts it in the trash can as if she's trying to give him a little bit of dignity, right? Thinking maybe then, if people don't think he's a drunk, maybe then people will stop to help. Well, guess what? 48 more people are walking by and no one is stopping. She then, this homeless woman, makes a fist to the heavens. And I'll never forget the look on her face because the camera, the hidden camera was really tight on her face. She made a face as if she was cursing God himself and the heavens, saying, God, how can you let, allow this to happen? And then she stumbled down again. And we could hear this because the actor on the ground was wearing a wireless microphone. She said to him, sir, I don't know your name, but I'm going to call you Billy. <laughs> she said, Billy, my name is Linda Hamilton. And don't you worry, my man, I'm, gonna, I'm homeless too. And I'm going to stay here until help arrives. And then finally, a woman stopped and called 911. And interestingly enough, when I went up to her and I asked her, why did you call? She goes, because I watch your show and I promised my children that if I ever saw something like this, I would be the one to step in. 
But in all the excitement, when we come out with the cameras, people are relieved that it was only a TV show and excited and we're having everyone sign releases. In all that excitement and that chaos, our hero, Linda Hamilton, the woman who stopped to help, slipped away. We knew her name and we put it on television a few weeks later. And the day after it aired on What Would You Do, we got hundreds of you know, social media posts and emails and phone calls at ABC because we said she was homeless with people asking, how do we help this woman? You know, they created a Facebook page with her picture from the TV set called Touched by an Angel, Touched by Linda Hamilton, and folks started raising money for her. So now, you know, they've raised $10,000 and we got to go find her to give her the money. So my producer said, John, you know, we sent our staffs out there for two weeks with her picture saying, have you seen this woman? Have you seen Linda Hamilton? We went to every train station and every homeless shelter in New York, New Jersey. And two weeks later, we finally found her. And my producer then said, John, you got to meet her. We got to come do an update and bring your laptop so we can show her the story. So I sat on some church steps in Newark, New Jersey with this homeless woman, Linda Hamilton, and I showed her the videotape. She goes, that's me? I said, yes. Remember when a man fell and you helped him? She goes, ah, oh, yes. So we opened up a bank account with the money that people had donated to her. I said, Pete, you're a, you're a huge star, you know? Uh, so we opened a bank account for her. We got her a place to live. Uh, we got her medicine that she was supposed to be taking for her heart condition, but wasn't. And the thing that made her most excited of all, we got her her own cell phone. So she was jumping up and down with joy, like a 12-year-old with her first cell phone saying, I said, now, Linda Hamilton, the next time you witness something disturbing, you can call 911. And at the end, I said, Linda, people are calling you a hero. They're, they're calling you an angel. They created this Facebook post page for you on Facebook saying, you know, touched by an angel. Are you, do you consider yourself an angel or a hero? She gave me this look that I'll never forget. She goes, no way, John Quinones, no way. She said, let me tell you what happened that day. She said, I think God put me on that corner, on that street, on that day, because he knew you were there with your what would you do cameras. And he wanted to teach people a lesson. And who better to teach that lesson than someone who has walked in the shoes of the homeless. So today I leave you with, with that message. The next time you witness an injustice, there's something troubling, and the little voice in the back of your head says, do something. Remember the words and the actions of Linda Hamilton, this woman who was homeless, who had suffered a stroke, and yet she stopped to help a stranger who was down, not because she was going to be on national television. She didn't know that. Not because she was going to get $10,000 in the bank and a place to live, medicine for her heart, and her own cell phone. She did not know that. She did it because, as my dear Mother Maria would say, her corazón, her heart, told her it was the right thing to do. Thank you for having me here. It's been a real pleasure talking to all of you. Thank you so much. Really, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're okay on time. Thank you. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you. My man. Brother, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. What an inspiring story. Uh, we're at this point now, we're going to take a slight break, but if you're interested in John's book, What Would You Do? Words of Wisdom About Doing the Right Thing, you can purchase a copy in the lobby next to the Marquee Theater, and John will be available to autograph and sign the book for a limited time. Uh, as I mentioned, we're taking the break and we get ready for our next discussion panel that will happen here. Um, in other words, if you see something, say something, and we'll start that conversation in about 30 minutes. Thank you so much.
minutes. I'll find out. It does it you, when you push it? We'll figure it out. Well, that's okay, last. Hey, panelists want to know if they should press the microphone when they talk or will they be live? I'll find out in one minute. Hello everyone, we're going to begin in one minute. Welcome back. If you will continue your networking during the noon hour, that would be tremendous, but we are going to move on to our next panel. My name is Mary Carley. I do communications for DDEEA, and along with Patrick Sims and Edward Brown, I'm very pleased to work with Nick Heinen, Valeria Davis, and Crystal Tucker in putting together today. And wasn't John Quinonez great? <laughs> now we'd like to turn our attention to a panel to help each one of us look at our ability and decide when we should say something. The motivation and success behind John's show is watching what it takes for bystanders to speak up. What drives them? Is it their inner convictions? Is it their experiences? Does it matter who's watching? Does it matter who the victim is? 
It's easy to look outward at the actions of others. It's an opportunity we have every day on this campus and in our community. But how comfortable are we in taking responsibility and taking an active role? Our speakers will explore the process of speaking up through the tools UW-Madison has and the human side of our fears and hesitation. Let me introduce our panel. To my right is Gab Gabriel Gabe Javier, Javier, Interim Associate Vice Chancellor for Identity and Inclusion of Student Affairs. Gabe arrived in Madison in 2011, first serving as Assistant Dean and Director of the Gender and Sexuality Campus Center and later the Multicultural Student Center. Gabe currently serves as Interim Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, as I mentioned, where he supports the Gender and Sexuality Campus Center, International Student Services, McBurney Disability Resource Center, the Multicultural Center, and the Veteran Services and Military Assistance Center. Next to Gabe, we have Pia Kenny James, a retired police officer with the Madison Police Department. Pia was hired as the city's first Madison African-American police officer, the first female, in 1975. She held a wide variety of roles during those 29 years in the department, from patrol officer to special operations, and retired as a forensic team investigator in 2004. Throughout Pia's life and career, she's been a volunteer mentor. She's worked to change the community. She's fought for universal justice and fairness to change the climate of policing and really has emphasized her work on improving the lives of women and children in our community. Finally, I'd like to introduce Cleta Wong, an Assistant Director of Residence Life for Inclusion at University Housing. Cleta has more than nine years of experience in higher education. She's an Assistant Director for Inclusion, where she oversees the Center for Cultural Enrichment and works with campus partners to help build inclusive residential communities. Cleet is committed to creating and fostering inclusive communities through her work in not only higher education, but our greater community. Please welcome our panel, and I'd like to toss it to Gabe Javier to start. Is this on? It's on now, right? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for not immediately booing. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that'll come later. Um, you know, um, what an amazing group of folks we have um, assembled today. So, as, as, you know, as we start, we think about, like, what if everyone in this room did one thing? And what an amazing network of action that would be. Um, <clears throat> my name is Gabe Javier. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I'm very happy to be invited to come chat with some of you. Um, and by some of you, I mean this huge group of people. And um, am I on the screen? So can I request a, f a filter <laughs> or like one of those masks? Um, <clears throat> so um, just a couple of comments I want to offer before we dive into some um, really great questions for um, my esteemed panelists. So, you know, uh, during um, ally trainings, I, I make a point um, of saying that allies are not superheroes, right? Superheroes are super in right now. I'm a big Marvel fan, you know. Um, allies are regular people who decide that they want to transform um, their deep beliefs into meaningful actions. So allies will fail and they will succeed because we are human. And humans, especially and including myself, are deeply flawed and imperfect actors. A lot of what I'm going to offer today is uh, from a book called A Person You Mean to Be, um, How Good People Fight Bias by Dr. Dolly Chug. Um, Chug is a social psychologist at NYU Stern School of Business. I'm also borrowing um, from past trainings I've done, um, things I've learned from wise practitioners, um, many of whom are, are in this room. Um, and it's really just happenstance that I happen to be um, invited to comment today because there are scores of other folks in this room today who could do a you know, better job than I can. So yes, I can talk louder. Thank you for, can everyone hear me OK if I speak like this? Thank you very much. Just let me know if you can't hear me. So the fast hard fact is that I often fail at intervening in situations. Um, you know, I might have passed up the opportunity to address a microaggression against a colleague, 
or perhaps I've waited just a split second too long to correct an assumption about a person who isn't the room. I've probably even in the past week paused just long enough for the window of opportunity to apologize to close. Um, I know that in my life I've allowed my internal, unconscious, and implicit bias affect a decision or cloud an interaction. So what I want to talk about <clears throat> um, today is, is what Dr. Chogue calls the nudge. You know, a nudge is a slight move, an incremental, perhaps a little further from where we are right now. The nudge, as I talk about it today, is a little piece of ally behavior or interventions that are perfectly reachable. Now, some of you, and if you do have the power and opportunity to make large-scale systemic change, then please do it. Even if you have the opportunity to make big changes every once in a while, please do it. Use your power in that way. But I know the opportunities where I've had the power to unilaterally fix injustice at the systemic level has been have been woefully few. So my dad does this thing when he's parallel parking, is he parks in between two cars so that no car can park in front of him or behind him. Does anyone have a person in their life who does that? And I'm like, if, or maybe you are that person. Um, and sometimes I'm just like, if, can you just scoot up? And then you can fit another car behind you. I wish sometimes I had the superpower to like nudge the vehicle, right? If we're able to nudge that vehicle and maybe the vehicle in front of it, then we can fit a whole other car. If we're able to make small nudges in the places where we are, we might be able to include someone who wasn't there. It's a specific opportunity we have, but it's a pretty decent metaphor. So Dr. Chug talks about these nudges as the things within our reach to make lasting change, right? Um, these nudges, as we know, really do add up, right? It's, it's our, it's, sometimes we have the opportunity to witness really horrible acts of racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, ageism. And we have to always interrupt harmful behavior whenever we see it. But more times than not, we have interpersonal interactions with other people that may have a deep but not wide impact. And so that sort of thing is what we need to try to make more common, that everyone understands that in their spheres of influence, their departments, their classrooms, um, the places they work, that they have the opportunity to nudge a little bit further. Right. Um, so the other piece that I often think about is like, am I a good person? Right. You know, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm probably a, a good enough person. The problem is that when we say we're a good person or a bad person, it seems like a binary, that we're always good or always bad, right? So we think about it as being good-ish, right? So we're good-ish, you know? So Dr. Chug says we must re redefine what it means to be a good person, to a person who is trying to be better, as opposed to someone who is allowing themselves to believe in the illusion that they are always a good person. I may have been one of the 80-something people that passed right by the person who collapsed on the sidewalk. Right? There are times that I don't often, I'm, I'm not as charitable as I want to be. Right? So does that wholesale make me a bad person? Instead, I think about I need to try to be a little better today than I was, or do something a little different than I have been. Right? So it's, it's a little bit of that nudge. So, you know, another quote. It may well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on me, or wait on time. Attribution for that quote? Martin Luther King from the letter of Birmingham Jail. So a couple of other things that I just want to point out as we think about what our nudges are, right? Not everyone has the same opportunity to intervene because there's power, there's situation, there's safety that all count into the, there's context, right? You know, um, so 
those things, we calculate very quickly in our head when we have the opportunity or we're faced with a situation that could, that could um, move us into action, right? Um, you know, uh, remember that it costs white people nothing to address racism. Right? It costs white people nothing to address racism. And we know this because we see this from teacher evaluations. Right? We see um, staff and faculty, instructional staff of color, um, you know, teaching a lesson on abolition or race, and they're often accused of having an agenda. Right? White staff or faculty instructional faculty you know, um, can teach the same session and be lauded for being so progressive. So there's a double standard. So, you know, there is, the white people don't sacrifice anything by talking about race, because as a person of color, I'm expected to be this like loud, sort of like, of course he's gonna have a problem with that. Um, you know, the, the last image I want to leave you with is one that I learned from a colleague who's a Northwestern, Rob Brown, and he talks about um, racism like a moving walkway. Moving walkway on in the airport, yep, you don't have to do anything. You just, you can stand there and it moves. Racism is in the same way, like it, you don't have to do anything and it still exists, right? So in order to counteract the moving walkway, you have to A, recognize you're on it, B, you have to turn around, and C, you have to work harder to move the opposite direction. And so such is the same with how we recognize racism in our lives and figure out how we have to double our effort to solve things. Right. So um, I'm going to turn to my wise and amazing um, colleagues and um, ask some questions. So we're gonna have some time for questions from the audience as well. So um, uh, I know I will be waved down when that opportunity comes. But so um, the first question is like, can you talk about um, what you think are some reasons why people don't intervene when they see something or um, when the opportunity uh, presents itself but someone decides not to intervene? Pia, yeah, yes, Hello. Is this okay? Louder? Better? <laughs> well, I think most people see something that's wrong and they may want to intervene, but maybe it's not safe to, or maybe they feel like they're being nosy or interfering. Um, when is it safe to intervene or when should you intervene? You have to go by your own gut feeling. There's no uh, rule or law that says you need to do something. Um, I personally uh, get involved with people's business maybe a little bit too much, um, probably because of my profession, uh, because if I see something going on that's uh, wrong or uh, someone needs help, you know, um, I, I feel like I, I can offer something. I may not be able to offer everything, but I can offer something, um, even if it's just comfort for the time being until um, someone else who can um, intervene is there. I do want to back up and just say, you know, I was born here in Madison, Wisconsin, and lived um, during and amidst the Civil Rights Movement and the UW-Madison um, Dow Chemical Riot and et cetera. And so we saw a lot of different things happening that um, in some sense are returning where people's attitudes are um, against each other rather than for each other. So, as I said, just the fact that intervening, intervening to me is a helpful way of trying to bridge that gap again. Um, my kids, who are grown now, um, say I intervene too much, and if they see me uh, getting ready to go someplace, they will literally stop me and say, Mom, stop, um, because they fear that I might get hurt. Now that I'm a senior citizen, they're worried about my physical <laughs> being. But um, I think that's in my nature, and I am trying to slow down a little bit because sometimes sometime I am interfering. Um, so. Okay. 
Safety comes to my mind um, when I think about this question, but I also think about context and where you are and the identities that you hold. Um, specifically, I think about a story um, or my experience growing up with a father who um, I would pretty much call him um, a bigot, even though I love him every day and I respect him. There are different opportunities of growth for him. When I was younger, I wouldn't challenge him due to my cultures that I grew up with out of respect for elders. Um, I would listen to everything that he would say, but I would try to um, process and critically think about what the words he was saying was harmful to others in um, different communities. And after, you know, two different degrees and experiences in the Midwest, growing up in Texas, um, it led me to challenge him in the last several years and um, respectfully and understanding how do I challenge him but also love him at the same time, um, but help him grow and help myself and others and advocate and be an ally for others um, who cannot be at the table to speak um, for themselves or individual communities. And so thinking about power dynamics, context, um, marginalized identities, but also privileged identities that you hold. So for me, understanding that if, as a you know, cis woman, how do I uplift the voices um, for folks who identify as gender non-conforming, um, non-binary, folks who, um, who have non-apparent disabilities, how do I advocate um, for different communities? So understanding your own marginalized identities, your own privileged identities, and knowing um, when you can't intervene and when you can't because of those identities. Thank you. Um, when you think of times uh, when you maybe wanted to intervene but did not, as you, you talked a little bit about, clearly you talked about, you know, you'd always interrupt or say something to your family, right, or in Pia that you sometimes intervene more than your children want you to. But in a, a time where you maybe didn't, like, what would have helped you? Like, was there, like, a particular, like, skill or knowledge or what things would have helped you um, as you, you you've gone through life, what things are increasing your um, comfort and capacity to intervene more than not? Well, I, I believe in fairness and justice and wearing someone else's shoes. So if I've seen someone in a difficult situation, I have to think of myself as well. Would I want help or assistance if I was in that same situation? Um, being Being a former police officer, there were some it, uh, situations that I had no choice, that that was my job. So I was going to intervene whether I wanted to or whether they wanted me to. Um, but again, I would intervene in a way that was either a safety-related issue, ma making it safe for them, or um, uh, comforting, or if they needed some type of help. And sometimes it was uh, uh, a detainment that they needed in order to get some type of help, whether it was a physical arrest, was it, whether it was a, um, uh, a referral to an agency that might help them in uh, mental health or um, whatever. But being um, a, uh, a justice person, you know, just believing that they need help if I needed help, I'd want them to come to my assistance. So I want to share a story. Um, September, we had an incident on campus, and I remember receiving a text message from a colleague um, about the incident. And in the moment, um, actually that morning, I had told myself I was going to take the day off because um, it was a Friday, and um, after receiving that text message, I, I knew because of um, my position, but also in supporting my colleagues, I had to come in supporting our students. I had to come in, and during my drive, I thought about all the different scenarios of what was happening because I had zero context. Um, I thought about my own identities. Do I feel safe in approaching the scene? 
are other people on campus going to be there from the Dean of Students office, from um, UWPD. Um, I had all these different scenarios running through my mind and I thought in that moment, because of my own marginalized identities, I froze. I didn't know how I was going to show up to campus. I remember turning from university onto Park Street and I saw UWPD um, vehicles and I felt some sense of security and safety, but then um, the incident was still happening. And I saw several of my colleagues from other departments approach um, two students um, during the incident, and I, I was still frozen. I felt incapacitated. I felt like I didn't know what to do because I was um, essentially, I, I didn't know how to react because of my own, per, my own marginalized identities. Um, and then I saw a colleague who holds privileged identities um, approach with another colleague and speak to the two students um, because they had to, right? They knew that they had privileged identities and at one point they were hesitant because of their position and they didn't know how um, things would end up but they still went because one of our colleagues um, was deeply um, affected by the incident and they had to intervene um, and I'm thankful for that colleague and it's knowing when you have people in your corner people who do hold privileged identities who in the moment are able to intervene and help and stop to have a conversation to um, explain um, that's really important and then for folks who hold marginalized identities, who are in that moment and they freeze, it's not our fault, right? We have experiences that we hold with us. We have trauma that we hold with us every single day. And just knowing that um, there are others who are able to help, that's something that we can hold. Um, and hopefully others can learn that when you do have power, it's important to utilize that power because others are dependent on you um, for their own safety. Thank you. Um, can you talk about um, an experience where um, you've, you've intervened and then it didn't go as planned? Um, how did you recover from that or how did you um, uh, so I'll, I'll share here's an example. So, um, you know, I, I think that <clears throat> when I think about this, I often think about how we go into opportunities or, or scenarios that we are very unfamiliar, right? And the fact of that is, is we should go into these, inf oh, these environments and these situations with a lot of humility, right? Understanding that oh, we may mess up, we will mess up, right? And you know, there's, an, there's a lot of social justice education talks about the idea of, of um, distinguishing behavior, right? So if I'm working with a colleague and um, they have clearly indicated to me that they use they, them pronouns and I continue to mess up, right? Messing up is not the distinguishing behavior. Saying to that person like, oh, I messed up. I know better, I'm so sorry and I'm gonna try to do better next time. That's the distinguishing behavior, because especially I would say like in this context of Midwest nice, we're more likely to just be like, oh, right, sorry, my bad, and like sort of crap walk away or like, you know, make it like more awkward than it needs to reasonably be, right? So, um, and no one likes to be another person's learning curve, right? So in those situations, when I've tried to intervene, for example, uh, with a, a, a colleague who uses um, pronouns, uh, they, them, um, where they may previously used she, her, right? I overstepped my bounds. Like, I um, told people, like, oh, heads up, they're using they, them now, not their old pronouns, right? I overstepped my bounds because I didn't check in with that person first. I didn't say, like, oh, so do you want me to correct people when they use the wrong pronouns for you? 
or um, you know, I know this is going to come up, but do you want to be the person to tell people, or how can I help you in that? Right? Is that how I, can I help you in that? That's you know, this this city of self determination. You're allowing the person who is most affected to be able to say what kind of help will most help them, right? So I know that there are tons of times when I've you know tried to be like the proactive person, but have have ended up really overstepping my bounds and saying like, okay, well, I should have just, I should have asked first. And that's humbling, right? So going into unfamiliar situations with cultural humility, understanding that no one likes to be someone's learning curve um, are two important lessons that I've learned. So back in 1975, I was hired as, as a police officer with the Madison Police Department. And, um, you know, there weren't, really uh, very many women in uniform on the street. I had no people of color, or few very, very few people of color. And so there was this resistance uh, inside the police department for us to be there in the first place. And uh, the first night that I worked with a field training officer who didn't speak to me for a couple of days, um, finally spoke and said, um, well, I don't like women on the police department, and I don't like black people on the police department, and I don't like people on welfare. And so I had two strikes against me just looking at me, you know. Um, so, so when I saw some unfairness, or I saw behavior that I didn't really think was fair to a, a community person, I felt like I needed to say something and intervene with that behavior. It was very difficult because if I said, well, would you like those cuffs on your hands that way? If you don't want the cuffs to cut off your circulation, why are you doing it to that person? My issue with that was I then had to work with these individuals who um, were my backup. They were my coworkers. So intervening with somebody's rights and safety and comfort uh, created some tension among the people that I work with. So it, it's sometimes hard to intervene, but when you know it's right, and you know you wouldn't want to be treated that way, um, and et cetera, then sometimes you have to make the decision to go ahead and do it, regardless of what the um, fallout might be. Thinking about, um you know, we, we attend so many different conferences, different workshops, different trainings, different forums, and sometimes speakers um, will say different things that impact or show um, visuals that affect um, members who are participating or audience, right? And I remember one time I attended something and um, a presenter had, pre you know, said some words and showed a video and I could clearly see in the audience that, wow, okay, it's not just me that's feeling this way. But in the moment, I couldn't say anything because I didn't want to interrupt. Um, but afterwards, I had emailed somebody and just wanted to share um, what had happened. Um, and I remember about a week later, um, I was told to be more resilient, right? And so it didn't go as planned in the moment. But a couple years later, I think that um, after you know, um, a couple of feedback pieces, there is change that does happen. So thinking about where are some moments where you can you know, try to say something when you see something or you're impacted or you see others who are deeply affected by something, um, even though in that moment it may not go as you, the way that you want, um, eventually things do change because over time people will see that you know, you're not just the only person who's speaking up and sharing your voice and your opinions in your experience, others will too, and so that accumulates, and that does create change. Thank you. Um, you know, um, you know, uh, John Kinnunas talked about moving to being a pro proactive bystander, right? And so, um, you know, this idea of being an ally or an advocate or an accomplice, um, a proactive bystander, you know, there's lots of different ways that people frame this idea of, um, thinking about our spheres of control and influence and intervening when we can. Um, so for 
if you had, you know, someone said to you, like, oh, how do I, how can I be an ally to you? Um, what, what advice might you give them? Um, or what, what uh, things might you say if they said to you, like, well, how can I be an ally to you? I think no matter what the situation is, um, people have to trust their own gut feeling. If it doesn't feel right or it's unsafe or um, there's some, a problem or an issue with it, um, they need to trust themselves and, and say, I'm not a part of this equation. But any, anytime somebody hollers for help or uh, assistance, you know, my gut feeling as a human being would be try to do what you can. Maybe you can't do the whole thing. Um, Maybe there's a small part, and even uh, we, we talk. We listened to uh, keynote speaker John today about a woman who said, "I, I'm, I just want to call for help for this person." Um, she wasn't giving him medical aid or whatever, just trying to get some help. So I think we have to do what we can, um, and I think all of us have it in us to be able to say, "Well, I can do this part. Maybe I can't do that, but I can help with this part." Um, calling for assistance or, or uh, help with with uh, someone who is in need is, in my opinion, a human trait that we all should have. For me, it's about educating yourself. Um, when I think about our shared future, um, for example, educating yourself about the land that we occupy here in Madison, but also the land that you occupied where you grew up in your hometown, right? Not just where you live now, but where you grew up, where you want to move in the future, what land does that occupy. Um, educating yourself and going to different opportunities like this, but also educating others, um, especially if you do hold privileged identities. For people of color, for our students of color, it's not our jobs, unless it is in our job title, to educate <laughs> folks from, you know, privileged backgrounds to um, educate you about our experiences. You need to do the work. As an ally, we will let you know when you're an ally when you do the work. You can't just deem yourself as an ally. So it's important to reflect on your own identities, do that self-work, um, and so that you can educate others as well for people. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to invite folks, if um, you'd like to present a question, um, there are mics on the side. If you're unable to come to the mic, um, hopefully someone you can indicate, make yourself known, and we can bring a mic to you, hopefully. Um, but if you'd like to ask me questions. No questions? Thank you for coming. So. <laughs> Hi, Gabe. What's up? How are you? Good. Okay. Anyways, um, on to my question. Um, I have one about how we can make the environment, um, mainly on campus, uh, more comfortable for people to speak up because I know a lot of times people don't want to in fear of backlash from administration, faculty, and other students. And so what are things that we as a community can do to build up POC to um, talk about the issues that they're encountering, like microaggressions. Sure, thank you. Um, so I'll start and then, so I think one of the keys is sustained engagement, right? Diversity Forum is two great um, days that are very concentrated, right? So what is the sustained engagement where um, we encounter opportunities to talk about diversity and equity and microaggressions all the time? Right? So it's not just when it's time for a forum or because, you know, we know that our spheres of concern are often much larger than our spheres of influence. We also know that interpersonally, individually with groups and systemically there's oppression, and, but there's also opportunities for intervention at all of those groups. So um, as Cleta said, like educating yourself is a really important piece. Um, and then recognizing like where where can you intervene? Like where are like look at your calendar and say like, these are the conversations that I have every week, 
like, are there times that I'm continuing to learn about what I need to learn about the situation of other folks on campus? Or am I, am I having some times so that I can talk um, with a community of practice, right? So um, folks in OHRD and talent management are doing some great communities of practice. And what that allows you to do is like get together with people and say like, how do I problem solve this? Like I messed up, you messed up, we've all messed up. How do we work through that? So having a community of practice is really important. Um, and one of the most important things that we can do is like, um, especially when we encounter students who address, who face microaggressions, is to affirm their, affirm that that's, their experience is valid, right? Um, and we also know that many faculty and staff of color have a double burden, and that double burden is having to deal with racism um, in their own lives while they help students deal with racism in their lives, right? So just the knowledge of these things, and when you have this knowledge, like, don't be like, okay, somebody come and listen to the knowledge that I have gained. I am ready to help you. No, please don't do that. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know if you. Well, you know, I want to piggy piggyback on that. It, but we all need help at some time, and I really get annoyed when someone will stereotype me or assume they know what I want or what I need, and say, "Here, I've got this beautiful knowledge picture." resource, whatever, for you, unless I'm un uh, incapacitated or unconscious or mentally incapacitated, ask me. Ask what you need. Don't assume you know what they need because they know more than anything. I know what I need. And if, if somebody wants to be an ally to help me with something, just ask me. Just don't assume and, and please don't stereotype. And you know, one thing I just want to insert there, P, I think, for saying that. I think that asking what people need or understanding what people need, not in a time of crisis, is actually really good, right? We often say to our students, like, you've got to plan for graduation before graduation, right? The bias incident report form, it, it can be really effective, and we encourage people to use that so we can follow up and look at patterns. But remember, that's, the bias has already happened at that point. So what are we doing it before that? When I think about the question, creating an environment where people are comfortable in speaking up, um, where they're safe to do so, I think about, are we having these conversations, right? Are you having these conversations in the classroom? Are you having these conversations in your departmental meetings? Is diversity, inclusion, and social justice at the forefront of your conversations? Because if it's not, then voices are being silenced. They're not being invited to the table. And these systems of whatever ism that you have, they will continue to run, right? They will com continue to be a well-oiled machine that um, will continue to silence and marginalize people who, um, whose voices aren't being uplifted. And so thinking about addressing valid experiences, educating each other, educating um, folks, but also not being silent, right? As John had shared, silence is being cl complicit. Um, also, sometimes people are really comfortable, and I call that complacency, right? People who have, I, I hold some privileged identities. Sometimes we're complacent because we're comfortable. And for folks who have marginalized identities, we sit in discomfort every single day in different areas of campus, in different parts of Madison, where we travel to. We'd sit in, we are in discomfort in different moments. And so if you can think about universal design, if you can think about having, regular, having conversations on a regular basis about people's experiences so that we can dismantle these different systems, I think that takes us to that level of creating this environment where people are feeling comfortable and sharing their experiences and sharing their truths so that we can dismantle all these systems together. Yeah, who's there? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Okay, so I'm not exactly how this forms as a question and sometimes I think that's also part of the problem with 
trying to work towards a better, being a better ally is sometimes not knowing how to talk about something or phrase something. But I was wondering if um, you had any suggestions for groups of people to embrace um, someone's story. Um, I had an incident that is irrelevant at the moment for this conversation where an unusual situation came up and um, I was stepping up to advocate for the person in the situation. And the first few people from different sections of my um, job, the first few people I talked to were very responsive. And then when people got into a group to discuss it, um, things became more complicated and um, there was less support for the person I was trying to advocate for. There was more um, discussion with me about what I was assuming. And I had the situation where the person I advocated for, for was willing to talk to the group and see how in the future something might be handled differently or changed for the better or explain exactly what happened in a way that maybe I couldn't because I was relaying, you know, actions in the incident and not necessarily the story. And um, although the person was very interested in telling their story, the group of people did not want to meet with them. And I did not know a better way to proceed. Um, and I didn't know if you had any advice on how to encourage groups as we're trying to move towards more diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it's part of what we are trying to improve. Um, if there was a way to speak to what, what ways can we hear someone's story, you know? Um, I found that very challenging, and um, it was interesting to me that when I spoke to individuals, there was a lot of support. And when individuals talked to each other and different parts of the organization talked to each other and they came together and they formed what they wanted to come across as a front, there wasn't that support. And um, I, I wondered if you could speak to that. Sure. Great, thank you for your question. So I think that stories, our own stories, like are the ones we are le least likely to mess up, right? So we always talk about um, speaking from your seat of experience and using I statements. If you're gonna translate, or if you're gonna talk about someone else's story, asking um, consent and permission to share those, those experiences. And I think we use stories to illustrate points, right? So it's an effective way to learn or teach a lesson. Right, so how do we take a person's story without taking and co-opting that person's experience and story? Right, so first asking permission, um, thinking about um, what are the most effective ways to communicate that. Perhaps, um, perhaps there's similar um, stories, uh, even you know, online or in case studies, that might, um, you know, sometimes uh, a strategy is to take it away, for, or not take it away, but um, make it a, less about the specific person in that experience and think about the universal lesson that can be learned, right? So, and then saying like, how do we apply what we are learning there through our different folks that we interact with, right? So it might be around universal design and ability, right? Um, so instead of saying this person needs um, uh, a large print text, Right? Maybe the question instead is like, can everyone access the material in all the different ways? Right? Because the person who needs large print text can be for lots of different reasons. Right? Maybe they're sight impaired, but also, you know, maybe it's a very dim room. Right? So that's an example of universal design and, and using that. I don't know if you have. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I you know I believe that if you're trying to help somebody. Um, tell their story, uh, you, you got to get the facts from that person, even if you do an outline as to what to say. Um, 
I don't really have trouble speaking up anymore, but some people do. And so if I'm going to tell someone's story, I want to ask what that story is about, how they've um, dealt with it or not dealt with it, some of the suffering or even the positive stuff that they uh, obtained through whatever they're trying to uh, share with somebody else. And then um, talking with uh, a group of people who may or may not understand, that group has to listen and not make assumptions that there's, there's more to this than, than there is. Um, telling stories will let you learn about an individual or a community or a state about um, you know, what the pros and cons are. Um, I always tell people, take off your blinders. You know, if you've lived in an area where you've never seen other types of people or cultures or uh, have a, a, a different languages, you know, take off your blinders and see what that person is about. And again, I have to go back to don't, don't stereotype about uh, someone. I think, I think in this room here, I bet you we all have stories that we can share. And they'll be similar, but they'll be real, real different. And you have to respect the fact that we all have different stories and, and we live life differently according to um, uh, how we were brought up and, and what our opportunities are. Good answer, sir. Hello. Um, I am someone who carries both privileged and marginalized identities. So I'm, I'm white, I'm well-educated, I'm mostly able-bodied. Um, but I'm, I'm also female, I identify as lesbian and genderqueer. And I know that my needs within my marginalized identities are very different than my needs within my privileged identities. So in my marginalized identities, I, I want to feel safe and comfortable. And in my privileged identities, I know that I need to take risks and be uncomfortable sometimes. I'm wondering if any of you can speak to those places where we're sort of living in a contradiction. We need different things because of the ways that our identities intersect. Thank you. Right, so yeah, so thank you for sharing that. So identity salience, right? Salience is the, the, the rise and fall of a particular social identity based on the context and what's important to us, right? So I often think about it, I'm Filipino-American, if I'm in a room full of white people uh, and I'm the only Filipino, I'm gonna feel my Filipino identity. If I'm in a room full of Filipinos and I'm a Filipino, I'm gonna feel my Filipino identity, but for two very different reasons, right? So context and salience become really important. I think intersectionality, from Kimberly Crenshaw, um, who's a black woman and an attorney, what's important about intersectionality is that it's not just the experience of someone at the intersection of multiple identities, it's their particular experiences of oppression. So it's not just that I am a gay man of color, but it's how in my life, heterosexism and racism have interacted from my personal experience, right? So I think to the question, like how do we negotiate those identities, I think is um, really thinking very critically about what you need from whom and what in what context. right? And pushing our communities to say like, you have to understand the complexity my, the complexity of my identities and that simplifying the way that I am presenting or are looking at like is an injustice that any no one would want. No one wants to just be judged or approached based on what people see or what they perceive. Right, so this is a really good opportunity to think about um, our emotional intelligence and empathy um, and inserting that. Um, and also, um, are you giving space for people to um, verbalize or indicate what they need in the situation, right? And not assuming that everyone processes in the same way, learns in the same ways, perceives in the same ways. So how are we allowing people, um, how are we doing our own sort of equity check as we move into whatever situation we're doing? I felt like that was like all over the place. This is not so much a question as it is a comment. I really feel uh, the need to underscore what Cleta said earlier. Um, I heard a scholar once say that uh, black and brown people did not create or invent systemic racism. So why is the onus on us to solve the problem? Why, why is it 
looked at as a black or brown problem. Um, I think that it's important that people who are privileged, uh, people who walk around in white packaging, um, take it up as their problem as well. It is not uh, something that we invented or created. It is all of our problem. And to that extent, the solutions are going to come from a true banding together, not just having these forums once a year and then you feel good because you came to a forum, but you go back out to the world and nothing really changes. So I guess that's a challenge, but certainly an underscoring of what you said earlier, Cleta. I think we, we all really need to hear that, that it is not um, exclusively a black and brown issue, but it is all of us, and we're at a tipping point, really, where we really have to start leaning towards solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, thank you for the comment, and I just want to compliment that by also saying, like, there are more white people, both in this room and at this university and in our state, right? And that white people have a race as well, in the same way that cisgender people have a gender identity and gender expression. And um, straight people have a sexual orientation, right? We all have ability status, you know? And we forget, I forget that because I have some of those privileged identities. So what does it mean to notice? And the thing is about systemic oppression and racism is that it's really hard to explain to someone something, some, explain to someone something that's totally invisible to them. Right? How do I explain racism to you if you don't even think that exists or that you don't think you have a race? Not, not you, Gia, I'm just, sorry, you. <laughs> um, so, you know, just something to think about as well, yeah. Any other? So let me just say something on that one. Okay. Um, the fact that we as people of color have not created the issue of what's, what racism is about, um, those who are willing to learn, step out, go to the other side of the tracks, um, go to meetings such as this and learn and really listen and then take it out and share it with people. Um, when you put yourself in somebody else's shoes for a period of time, you might see something and feel something that you've never felt before. And I'll, sh I'll share a story, uh, and I'm sorry I keep going back to law enforcement, but that's, that was my 29 year sentence, so. Uh, um, a group of friends, and by the way, I worked with wonderful, wonderful officers. I know the one I talked about before was bad, but um, I worked with a great group of people, but those great people were willing to listen and learn about other people, other cultures. And so I, I worked with a group of women who, uh, we had commonality, we all had kids, we all were divorced, we uh, worked the night shift. I mean, we just had commonality. So we started hanging out and supporting each other through some of the difficult times, whether it was raising kids or uh, working, you know, crazy, crazy hours and crazy, crazy scenes. Um, so we'd get together and we camped together and we had our wine together and we traveled together. And, and uh, But one day I said to them, and this is a group of four women, I said, you know, I really love being with you guys. I really love going to the, all these different uh, restaurants and bakeries that I've never been to before, but they're all outside of Madison and they're all white. Um, I, I don't feel comfortable all the time. They, oh, Pia, you know, you're, well, no, 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 I still don't feel comfortable. People watch me, they look at me. Oh, no, 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 I said, yes, they do. They look at me, they watch me eat, or they, when I walk in the door, the people watch me. I'm aware of that, and they were not. Now, these are good friends, but they learned something about it because I said, Put yourself in my position. Meet me down at a bar that is predominantly black uh, patrons. And I'll meet me there at noon. And I'll show up at 12.15. <laughs> and they finally saw and felt what I felt all this time being in the communities. They learned something and they shared it. They said, Wait a minute, wait a minute, we never saw this. Of course you didn't. Those blinders weren't taken off until you felt it. 
So when they shared these feelings about uh, what it's like to be in somebody else's shoes or culture or whatever, um, I think it helped. Uh, there is a program going on, Dr. Reverend G, Justified Anger. And I've had several people in the community say, oh, Pia, come on, come on, you gotta go, you gotta go. And I said, I've been, <laughs> but I already know about all that. This is for you to learn, and then you to share to other people, especially people who are either white or have the privilege. I know what it's about, and I've shared it all my life. So you go and learn, and then you share. So I have to give him a little kudos because it's hard to stand out and say, this is wrong, I want to change. And when you do, it does make a world of difference for everyone involved. Thank you. So uh, I have a, a couple minutes, so perhaps one last question, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, hello, my name is Xin uh, from SuccessWorks. Uh, my question, if you're willing to share, could you please share a time that you were uh, microaggression at workplace and how did you navigate that challenge situation and what general advice do you have for young professional people of color to advance their career and also embracing their marginalized identities? Thank you. So the question is uh, microaggression at the workplace and how Perhaps we handle that, and if we have advice for young professionals of color. Would you like to address that? So, <laughs> well, this is a question. Um, I, I immediately thought of a, a situation that happened this summer. Um, one of our colleagues um, got a new opportunity um, at a different institution, and um, they had already left. And um, someone I don't really interact with too often, maybe once or twice a year, um, saw me somewhere on campus and they said, oh, congratulations on your new position. And I'm like, what? I got promoted? Or, you know, I, I, I didn't know what had happened. Um, and I realized, oh, they, missed, they have mistook me for another um, Asian American on this campus. Um, and I just let them keep going because I was still trying to process what was happening and then they realized that they mistook me for somebody else and so in that moment they deeply apologized um, appro they appropriately apologized they also had a follow-up email apologizing and said that they would do better and they understand the harm that um, was caused and so I appreciate um, that sometimes we also experience microaggressions where in the moment we don't feel comfortable because we are experiencing trauma. You know, microaggressions are like, mus we talk about mosquito bites that happen over and over again, paper cuts that happen over and over again, and they reopen wounds um, from experiences in the past. And it's important to um, know in the moment when you're experiencing a microaggression, especially as a person of color or um, any other marginalized identities that you hold, that you have to process um, in that moment um, seek folks who are your allies and um, process with them if you want to process with them. Um, Self-reflect, but also, um, I don't wanna use the word hold people accountable, but you have to, when you are comfortable in your time that you're comfortable with in approaching or emailing or having a conversation with that individual or individuals, it's important to, to share with them the harm that they had caused because who knows how many other people they have caused harm to, unknowingly, right? Whether it was their intent or not, it's about impact. It's always about impact. And so if they continue to do the harm because no one has ever shared with them the impact of their harm, then they're gonna continue to harm. So when you are comfortable enough, when you feel safe enough, when you have support, and maybe even bringing a support person with you do it. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to reiterate uh, a piggyback on that. Like I, uh, if I had advice for other um, young professionals of color and other marginalized identities, and something that I learned when I first came here, a, a previous director of the MSC told me was that I am not responsible for other people's personal transformation. Like, it's just too much energy. 
right? And so I would say to young professionals of color, like find your community, the people who you can debrief and process with, and don't feel like you always have to do it. It is okay for you to say, nope, not gonna do it today, because that's self-preservation, right? Harvey Milk, you know, said, I would, um, if I turned around everyone, every time someone called me the F word, I would walk backwards, right? So we, absolutely, it's okay to choose. Um, uh, and it's okay to find your communities of support. Um, and for white allies and other, major other majority populations, your job is to say, I believe you, right? Thank you for telling me. What are the ways that I could have been more helpful? Right. Okay, I think that's our show. So thank you all very much. Um, I hope the rest of your experience is great. So. Thank you all for giving us insight and perspective and how we can see something or do something when we see something that doesn't sit well. This includes our decisions to speak up or pull someone aside privately. It's never a one approach fits all, but we all do play the role where we can be comfortable and do something. Um, we're going to take a quick break for lunch, and I'm going to plead with you to be back here in 30 minutes. We'd like to begin our uh, program at 12.20. We'll have a special showing of a special video, Why I Love UW. It will feature uh, Reverend Alex G. And we also have our much-anticipated 2019 Outstanding Women of Color honorees. We will tell you who they are, as well as the UW recipient of the Dr. P.B. Poorman Award. See you back here soon. Thanks.
How's everybody? You can keep eating. Well, we're going to go ahead and begin this portion. Feel free if you haven't grabbed a bite to eat yet. We know the line is kind of long. Uh, one of the pieces that I think it's obvious is that we may have outgrown this capacity. That's a good problem to have. We'll clap for that, right? As I understand it, uh, Mary Carley and her team from the Division of Diversity, Equity, Educational Achievement, Valerie Davis, Crystal Tucker, Edward Brown, all the staff, Tracy Williams Macklin, all the staff, Nick Heinen, uh, who helped pull this together, the staff here at the union. Uh, let's give these folks a warm round of applause as well. Yes. So 1,400 is it what we had registered? Which is an increase from last year, which is around 1,100. Which is an increase from the year before, which is around 800. Which is an increase from the year before that, which is around 600. So I think we're doing something right. And I don't mean just us, I mean you. You're taking advantage of this opportunity to build your capacity as we think about how we engage diversity, equity, and inclusion. In similar fashion, if you heard the panel after uh, John Keonis this morning, um, amazing uh, feedback. Kudos to Gabe, Cleta, and Pia sharing their thoughts and wisdom on stepping up. All right. So I want to practice what I'm preaching. Uh, when, I, when I did my intro remarks earlier today, you know, we talked about creating an environment where everyone feels welcome, valued, and included. That means we also include members of our transgender and non-binary, uh, individuals who identify in the non-binary gender spectrum. Uh, we refer to folks as ladies and gentlemen. We also want to refer to folks as folks who are not on that binary spectrum also. So I want to acknowledge that, uh, that that's part of the capacity building experiences that we all have to go through, myself included. Uh, we never get it right. It's very much a journey. So we want to apologize. We did not want to make anyone feel excluded. Uh, and I think it's always a good thing to practice what you're preaching and try to model that behavior that you want to see happening elsewhere. So I, I own that. But now to the task at hand, which is acknowledging our honorees for this upcoming uh, 2019 Outstanding Women of Color Awards here at UW-Madison. Yes. The Outstanding Women of Color Award of Reception honors women of color who are deeply rooted in both the campus and Madison community through their work towards social justice, service, research, and community building. This year, the selection committee received more than 50 nominations, which also is a twofold increase in what we had the year before. So again, we're doing something right. Over 50 nominations of women who exemplify the title of Outstanding Woman of Color. That's a tremendous statement about our campus community including those who take the time to nominate these women for the recognition. We've never run short on women who are a force on this campus, in the community, and in their own lives. We started this effort back in 2007, so we're glad that it's still continuing today. I especially want to thank the committee for their time and effort involved to pick seven honorees from all the wonderful people who have worked so hard and making huge differences in the world that we have here as part of our campus community, living out truly the tenets of the Wisconsin idea. Typically, the honorees don't know that their colleagues have nominated them or how highly regarded they are for their work, their outreach, and their dedication to service. On top of that, they are so humble and busy that they've never really had a chance to meet each other until we convene them for their award recognition ceremony. It's always a delight to see them come together at the reception and form an instant bond and relationship that is more than we could ever imagine. So I'm looking forward to meeting this year's cohort, which includes, drum roll, drum roll, drum roll, drum roll. You ready, Val? Desiree Bates, computational chemistry leader, <laughs> chemistry at the College of Letters and Science. Shiva Bidar Silov, Chief Diversity Officer, UW Health, and City Madison Alderperson for District 5. Gina Green Harris. Director, the Center for Community Engagement and Health Partnerships, the School of Medicine and Public Health. Eden Inoue Rani, the Chief of Staff for the Provost Office. That lady has saved me on more times than I care to admit. Laura Manero Meza, a doctoral student, Counseling Psychology, School of Education. Also, 2019-20 internship 
the Simo Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UC Los Angeles. Anna Scope, Professor, Genetics, College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. And last but not least, Jasmine Zapata, Assistant Professor, Pediatrics, School of Medicine and Public Health, also Centennial Scholar at the UW Institute for Clinical and Translational Researcher. Please, a warm round of applause for all of our nominees. Now there's more. This year also marks the 11th anniversary of the founding of the Dr. P. P. B. Poorman Award for Outstanding Achievement on behalf of LGBTQ plus people, which is overseen by the UW system. The annual award is given to representatives of the system's 13 campuses to honor LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus people or their allies who have helped to create a safer and more inclusive climate for LGBTQ plus people. The award celebrates the memory and legacy of Dr. Paula B. Poorman, a highly regarded faculty member at UW Whitewater who dedicated her life to improving the lives of LGBTQ plus people. Our UW Madison 2019 recipient is J.C. Botsford. We're proud to say Jay is now a member of the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Educational Achievement, continuing amazing work with our learning communities for institutional change and excellence. Jay is a former program coordinator for Transgender Youth Resource Network and Wisconsin Transgender Health Coalition in the School of Medicine and Public Health. The 2019 Poorman Award recipients will be honored on November 7th, that's this week, during a ceremony hosted by UW System President Ray Cross and in conjunction with the UW System's presentation of the Outstanding Women of Color in Education Awards, which will honor our UW recipient, Mariela Victoria Quesada Centano. Let's give, again, a round of warm applause for all of the honorees. We will officially acknowledge our honorees for the Outstanding Women of Color at a reception on Tuesday, March 5th, in the Alumni Lounge of the Pyle Center from 5 to 7.30, so mark your calendars. That's Tuesday, March 5th, 2020. Right, I wish John would have to say 2020, right? Uh, from 5.30 to 7, of course, we'll send out reminder emails and invites to make sure people are there with us. Now, I, I want to turn your attention, shift gears a little bit, sort of talk about what each of us can do in our own spheres of influence. And I want to share with you a project that was birthed in some ways out of a need to talk about those small victories, the things that each and every one of us do every single day that makes a difference for folk that we may never know we've had that impact on their lives, but they know we've had the impact on their lives. And so there's so much talent and promise that exists in this room and throughout a broader campus community. I want to invite you to imagine what it would actually feel like if everyone, every student, every future student, graduate, staff or faculty member or administrator actually felt an experience that presented pride, compassion, and dare I say love for this institution. What would that feel like? Well, hopefully this video can give you just a little bit of what we're talking about and how we want that experience to be the same for all of us who are part of this community. So I'll turn it over to the folks who are going to show a little video about why I love UW. We have 13 degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in my family. What's really interesting about the story is that we came into this campus through programs for non-regularly admissible students. My guidance counselor told me I was not university material. I have my bachelor's here and went on to do a doctorate. I created a nonprofit called Nehemiah, an initiative called Justified Anger. Yeah, I've traveled the world lecturing about my work and becoming an adjunct faculty member, and I develop leaders. But all of this really grew out of one woman coming here to find a better life. Mom was a high school dropout in, in 55. She had this break between 13 and 30 where she was a key punch operator and a factory worker. In 1970, I was, I was six years old. My mother took a small vacation, spent a few days with her friend Dorothy. 
Mom fell in love with all the grass, how green Madison was, the lakes, but she loved the campus. And when she saw students walking up Bascom Hill barefoot, wearing dashikis, natural hair, she said, I want this. I, I, this is what I want to do. So mom went back to Chicago, packed us up, and moved here. It was a good move for her because she was in an abusive marriage to my father. And so I think she saw Madison as a, as a way of having a brand new start. She said she wore lots of grays and browns because she was really depressed. And she came to Madison, changed her wardrobe, started wearing an afro, African garb and dashikis. There was one day, and I believe mom was taking her placement test. Because if you just come from high school, they have your records. Well, mom's records were 13 years old. She dropped out her freshman year, so she had to take placement tests. And mom was like an all-day testing. But the campus set up cartoons. And my sister and I felt like we were getting VIP treatment. So we got to come to campus and watch cartoons. And it was a Saturday. That's my first clear memory of the University of Wisconsin. So my mother took the entrance exam, and she crushed it. The community nor the campus said, wait, look at your background. You want to do what? You want to come here and become who? The question was, how can we help you succeed? You need child care? All right, we have a program for that. Uh, do you have a place to stay? Oh, you just moved to Madison? We've got some vouchers. Let's help get you set up. And this wasn't subsidized housing. This wasn't HUD housing. This was a beautiful apartment complex. They set my mom up for success. It wasn't like, all right, what are you here for? You're one of those single mothers from the west side of Chicago. We heard about you. The city and the campus asked, what can we do to make you successful? And they accommodated her. And I'm still benefiting from that accommodation that this campus made for my mother almost 50 years ago. Her major was behavioral sciences and law. She was really setting herself up for law school. Philosophy, history, African-American history. She wasn't taking basket weaving one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, she was in the heady stuff. And she was doing this while America was really struggling. This is 1970. People were still burning bras. People were shutting down the campus for the Black Studies Department. The Black Panther movement was not a distant memory. That stuff was real live. The assassination of King was only two years old. March on Washington was only seven years old. It was turbulent times, and she jumped into the midst of all of that with people who had been in educational systems continuously since they were in kindergarten. That she just jumps in to this world like she was meant for it, and she absolutely loved it. I have to be honest, this is a world-class university. It's an amazing campus. I love it, but they didn't make my mother intelligent. They, they made a demand on her intelligence. They drew out that intelligence. They said, put it in papers, um, put it in book reviews, talk to us about it. And this place brought it out for her. They gave her the space. And the campus, being around other thinkers from around the world, that was her first real community. My mom has a master's from here, a terminal degree. I have my bachelor's here and went on to do a doctorate. And so they changed the admission standard for us. But every one of us met the graduation standard. That when the campus does that on the front end, they do not reduce what it takes to graduate. And then my mom recruited her sisters and her sister's children. But I met my wife my senior year. Our daughter just graduated from here. This fall, my daughter is starting as a first year grad student in the Department of Library and Informational Sciences. We invited my mother over the day she decided to apply. And my wife and I stood over my daughter and her laptop, and we sang Varsity. And I remember us waving our hands and singing, you, rah, rah, Wisconsin. Then my daughter hits the send button. That was a powerful moment, because my mother made this huge sacrifice so that I could have the life that I do now. And to see that that is passed along to her grandchild is really amazing. This place changed my life because of who it helped my mom to become. It helped me become who I am and my wife who she is. But now it's helping our daughter become who she's going to be. It's even hard to put the significance of all of that into words. But to have that three-generation legacy, and we're all still here in Madison, is really amazing and very, very important to me. We intend to produce a series of these videos that highlight the extraordinary in the ordinary. The experiences he described were the result of actions that were taken by folk like you, who simply did their job 
in service and support of bettering his lived experience. And so I want to salute each and every one of you for the hard work that you do. And I also want to acknowledge Dr. G, his wife, and his sister. They're with us today, if you wouldn't mind standing. So there's a shameless plug. Dr. G is actually going to talk about the Justified Anger Coalition that he started and a breakout session tomorrow. So if you happen to be interested and available, we understand that we have some competing sessions that people are torn and don't know what to do. I say, that's a good problem, right? But hopefully, we'll get a chance to have him come back and share with us if you don't get a chance to catch him tomorrow. We don't have to imagine, folks, what it's like to have a rewarding experience with the institution that enables us to embrace the institution for all of its imperfections, but also acknowledge and celebrate the institution and instill a tremendous sense of badger pride that sets all of us up for success. That's what each and every one of us do as a community. I just want to remind us that we work and support people from all walks of life and that no one loses when we raise the floor for everyone. Just think about that as you continue your journeys of discovery as you engage diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, I'm going to ask Mary to come back to the podium and give you a little rundown of what's happening this afternoon. And hopefully, you have a little extra time to finish the, good, the goodies. If you didn't get the cookies, I think I only took one, so I'm going to go back and get my other cookie. Uh, but we hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions today. Thank you so much for being with us. Mary? Thanks, Patrick, and this will be very quick. In about 15 minutes, you'll have the opportunity to choose between two large breakout sessions. The first is Building Equity and Inclusion in Public Schools. It will be happening right here in Varsity Hall. The second choice is Difficult Conversations, Navigating Social Identity and Positionality, and that will be in the Marquee Theater. After that, we invite you to come back for our annual town hall here in Varsity. This year, the topic is the discomfort of public discourse confronting the legacies of white supremacy. It's a timely, it's an important discussion. We'll see you back here promptly at 2.30 for the ending of the day. Thank you.